that's how you want to play. We'll play the podcast way. I don't know, right? What the <laughs> fucking... That was, what, yeah, that was great. What does this character say? That. What does she sound like? I don't know. It's hard because the accent's so specific that she's doing, so it's really exactly. hard to nail it. It's hard. She, I don't I mean, have months to hammer it out like she did. Right. She she spent so much time watching half of a James Bond movie <laughs> and Angelina Jolie's scenes from Alexander <laughs> to, to prep for that accent. I mean, you know there's what? just so much that went into it. Wait, was that not Angelina Jolie in the movie? <laughs> <laughs> well, she, I mean, Anne Hathaway ingested Angelina Jolie, so <laughs> right. she's inside her, yeah. but, you know, you can't yeah. really see her. What if what if Bob Zemeckis had just reused naked gold Angelina Jolie from Beowulf? Someone <laughs> right. pointed out in the Reddit recently how much of a pattern there is in Bobby C's filmography of using people's likeness against their will. It's really like if, if the numbers really add up. From the Beatles to Bill Clinton to Angelina Jolie. To Crispin Glover. Y- yes. To Humphrey Bogart. Humphrey Bogart in, in Tales from the Crypt. To four former presidents. Yeah, that's true. Right? One in Contact, three in Gump. Yes. No, absolutely. I mean, only one living president, but you're right. You're right. Yeah. I'm just saying maybe at some point Zemeckis should announce a movie where that's his cast. Gold Angelina Jolie. Reused footage, Crispin Glover, four presidents, Humphrey Bogart. He technically stole Christopher Lloyd's image to make Back to the Future. Like, that was... Christopher Lloyd didn't agree to be in that. No. He doesn't have any idea that he was in those movies. He, no, if no, you no. bring it up to him now, he's like, huh? What? <laughs> Kid, I was in the Adams Family. I, I don't know what you're talking about. I mean, about. it's... I it's, created it's, Frasier. Wait, no, that's well, a different one. <laughs> that's a different one of my <laughs> all-time favorite film Twitter uh, uh, jokes. The uh, I, I liked Pete's Dragon a lot, but it was kind of rude of the crew to not tell uh, Robert Redford that he was in a movie. <laughs> I was watching Songbird, the, uh, the the quarantine movie with uh, Hot Archie, and Peter Stormare is like the bad guy in it. And uh, it's very much one of those things. It's like, when did they tell Peter Stormare that they were making a movie? Uh, or they just found him wandering around Los Angeles knocking on people's door. <laughs> it was just a break-in. Um, Guys. Well, you know what? You know what? I'm sorry. that The quote opening was kind of weak, David. I'm sorry. I know you want to get the show started, but let me let me just try it again. Let me do it with the tagline for this movie, okay? Oh, please. This Halloween, bring the big podcast home. Yes, uh, the big podcast, the biggest podcast there is. Because, of course, the tagline for this movie is just, this Halloween, bring the big screen home. Yeah, well, you know, this is a Max original, okay? And that means it's from my friend Max from yep. second grade, who I used to play soccer with. That's what I assume that means, right? That branding. Uh, this film is a Max original. David, what were you going to say? What was I going to say when? Before I cut you off with that stupid tagline thing. Oh, I can't remember. I literally can't remember, and that was a minute ago. I mean... You know, anything. Anytime I'm thinking about this movie, it just seems like things just kind of leave my mind really, really quickly. Oh, here's what I was going to say. Here's what I was going to say. Is this the first movie we've ever covered where the uh, top three build actors are Anne Hathaway, Octavia Spencer, and Stanley Tucci? Or I'm trying to remember. Was there, is there, is that Inception? Was that, I'm trying, you know, what what else had those three? I mean, obviously, Hathaway and Tucci have worked together before. Yes, obviously, they're in Prada. And then I keep on feeling like the other two sides of that triangle have worked together before, but is that just in my imagination? Uh, Octavia and Tucci? Tucci played all the math and hidden figures. (laughs) Of course. Octavia Tucci, Octavia Hathaway. Have neither of those happened before? Well, you know... What's the easy way to look this up these days? Because the problem is now, if you Google these combinations, they're just like, the witches? I heard you were interested in a Max original. Yeah, everyone's interested in a Max original. Look, throughout quarantine, I've had days where I am just uh, a slug, a depressive slug, and I cannot function. And I have days where I'm like manic and I'm over-focused. It's hyper-obsessive on different things. I have too much energy uh, in an unhealthy way. And then I have days like today where I just wake up and I just go like, I, j- I just, I just don't want to, I just fucking don't give a shit about anything. And then I watched the witches and I watched the Disney investor share conference fucking shit. 
And then I text you guys. I was like, can we push back 30 minutes? I just, my brain just doesn't want to fucking do this. I just like can't string together coherent thought. I, I assumed you just started the movie late. No, because I was watching the Disney thing. I was watching the Disney thing uh, uh, after. But I just didn't feel, I just like was like, and and you said right before we started recording, well, don't worry, we'll only do 40 minutes on the movie. But it does feel like one of these things where it's like, what do we even say about this thing? Which I don't feel like I dislike as much as most people. It's just kind of like impossible to really form a strong opinion about. Do you know how many, I, I have seen this movie three times now. Have you really? What? Be, be, yeah, because I watched it when it was first available for critics and then I had to review it like a, two weeks later and I was like, I don't really remember it. I have to watch it for like the details. I watched it a second time and was like, oh, there aren't details. And then I forgot that there weren't details and I watched it a third time for this podcast and I was like, "Why?" I, I, I got everything I needed from the first viewing. <laughs> he keeps bringing you back though. You think you're out, Bobby pulls you back in. Here's the thing and yeah. you can introduce this podcast and our guest eh, maybe. after this, but look, if this movie had come out in March, maybe I would have gotten a little more out of it. If this movie had come out in theaters and I had sat down in a big room with a nice popcorn and soda combo to watch it. Maybe I would have gotten lit out of the camera moves and the, you know, costumes and the, right, you know, like, oh, there's some stuff going on. Like, nine to ten months into quarantine on HBO Max, like on a Tuesday night, an adaptation of a book I know backwards and forwards and like a movie that's already been made. I was just like, I no, I'm sorry. I just don't have the like emotional I don't have the sympathy for this like I, I, yeah. it, I'm just this is getting some of my attention and I'm just gonna kind of stare at the wall sometimes maybe it's not the movie's fault maybe it's the world's fault but like this this one's just not gonna break through that's all I, I I couldn't agree more. It is also fascinating that this is one of those movies where, like, I feel like a lot of the things that have got pun gotten and punted straight to streaming recently, you watch them and you go, "Wait, how is this ever going to come out in theaters?" Right? Like Artemis Fowl. Right. And you watch this and you're like, "This is a movie that could only exist in theaters." It somehow makes less sense on a streaming service. Like all of its strengths and weaknesses only really make sense. If you're held captive in a theater for an hour yes. and 45 yes. minutes. And, yes. and that's been the big realization during this whole year is like what movies cannot survive any kind of distraction. You know, yeah. like this isn't a great movie no matter where you see it. But like like a dog barks on the street outside or a tr or the wind goes through a tree. And I'm like, huh? And like I, I just lose <laughs> right. this movie instantly. Or just, you know, devoid of, of the, the shame of looking at your phone. You know, sitting on your couch where you're like, I could just up my Disney Emoji Blitz score now. There's there's almost nothing holding you back. Right. Wh who's watching? No one knows. I mean, here's the most damning backhanded praise I thought of at the points I enjoyed in this movie. Okay? This is like a pretty good late period Tim Burton movie. Mm -hmm. Well, that's the thing, though. When you're watching it, you're like, every 10 minutes you have to be like, remember, this is not a Tim Burton film. And you're right. like, what? No, it is. What are you talking about? And then you have to like look, check IMDb. Oh, Zemeckis. That's weird. Everything about this just screams Burton. Like, but okay. I guess Eva Green isn't in it. it yeah, it's very Miss Peregrine. Like, obviously, yeah. as people know, my favorite Tim Burton movie ever. Of course. Of course. You're the, <laughs> the king of peregrines. Yeah, but it, it, it definitely exists in the same universe as, yes. as Miss right. Peregrine. But, but I'll say... For me, like, Dumbo edges out witches by a good margin because it has, like, it feels personal in many ways. It has ideas in it. There are moments of genuine inspiration. Like, you know, there, there are things in it, right? It's a lopsided movie that we, you know, half-heartedly defend. But I prefer that. Uh, but this, I prefer probably to like to Peregrine, certainly to Alice in Wonderland. It feels more coherent than those sorts of movies. I mean, like Zemeckis innately has a better story sense than Burton. He's able to make a script kind of just at least be coherent uh, with regards to itself, like on its own terms. And it feels a little less uh, obnoxious than something like Alice, which is just throwing shit at you against the walls. This is like a little more focused in its mania. Well, because the source material is 
you know, a classic, obviously, depending on Solid. Like, yeah. what you think about Roald Dahl. But the thing is, three things happen in the story. He meets a witch, they go to the hotel. You know, it's it's so simple. Um, and you can't really judge that up too much. I mean, Nicholas nope. Rogue didn't do it. Uh, Zemeckis doesn't do it. Um, whereas something with Peregrine, which has a more modern sense of storytelling sensibility or an Alice movie that they can just do whatever the fuck they want, then then you have too much room for embellishment. It's also nice to watch a movie like this where unlike Peregrine or Alice, there aren't like franchise ambitions. Right. There's all the weird Roald Dahl branding on the film, including that weird logo that happens in the middle of the credits. I hate that. Where clearly Roald Dahl is like the estate is trying to really uh, – monetize the library a lot more and brand it but like this is just a self-contained story it's just a movie the exact kind of thing that is maybe most in danger of falling by the wayside like it is bizarre i i should say reluctantly i should admit that this is blank check with griffin and david i'm griffin oh i'm david i'm so sorry i was Every zoning episode, out thinking about robert zemeckis's the witches your your cue time is getting I- I'm sometimes more on it than others. It's not getting worse. It's, I'm just saying it's that variable. If we all like to rag on all the things Griffin does incorrectly, but maybe we found a thing that David does incorrectly. I'm so sorry. So the score Carry is on. 47 Griffin, 1 David. <laughs> <laughs> The podcast is called Blank Check with Griffin and David. It's about filmographies, directors who have massive success early on in their career and are given a series of blank checks to make whatever crazy passion projects they want. Sometimes those checks clear, and sometimes they bounce, darling. I don't. Is that a, <laughs> there's sure. there's something I can't even. I I watched this movie hours ago, and I cannot remember. Is it like an Eastern European thing? What is the voice? She's she's like Russian. Yeah, it's Russian meets Scandinavian. Right. It's the border of Finland and Russia. I guess it it's a choice. I'll say that. And I don't mean that in a bet. You know how people are like, well, that was a choice. I'm like, look, she made a choice. That's something. It's also, I mean, we. I guess we can talk about the rogue film, which, but like, it's it. The, if no matter what you think of the rogue film, the the Angelica Houston performance is the thing that sticks out the most, I guess, outside of like the horrifying makeup effects and you know the fact that it traumatized children. So I guess it's a tough act to live up to, right? challenge sort of this is Let me, very I faint mean, praise i want to say this like accent ragging out of the way i genuinely enjoy this movie whenever hathaway or octavia are on screen i enjoy it more yes. I, don't, I don't love it but i'm like entertained i find that they're both innately engaging and i think they're both having fun here the mice shit just a hundred percent. I was about loses to me. say, but like, right, yeah. You enjoy it when Anne Hathaway and Octavia Spencer are on screen, and you love it with all of your heart when there's little mice running around, right? That's what you're about to say. That's that's what you're going yes. for, right? And you just love it so much. It is bizarre how much the the mouse shit loses me. I mean, they suck. Like it was just automatic turnoff. I told a story recently. Or I didn't tell this story, but it was on Twitter. People were doing the meme of like, what's the best movie going experience you ever had? And I shared a story of when my grandfather and I went to see the Jude Law Alfie remake, like six weeks after it had came out and bombed. And the only other people in the theater were in, at, at, like an ancient looking man like uh, older than my grandfather, who was probably nearing 90 at the time, and his handler. And the guy looked like just kind of mentally uh, uh, incapacitated. Okay. <laughs> and so there's just this guy who's like sitting there like frozen and they play the trailers and he's just sitting there frozen. I keep on looking back to the guy because he's the only other guy in the theater. I'm kind of curious, right? And then the trailer for the SpongeBob movie comes up and the guy suddenly like comes to life, leans forward in his seat and just goes, Bull! <laughs> wow. Boo! And just keeps booing for the entirety of the trailer. Then the trailer stops. He stops. He goes back to the sunken place. The other trailers play. <laughs> and then right before the movie starts, there's like a branded SpongeBob, you know, don't forget to get your popcorn and turn off your cell phones thing. And he's back on it. He turns on again. He leans in and goes, boo. And I felt like that old guy every time the mice came on screen. And, and that's how you <laughs> met Rex Reed. That's how I met Rex Reed. 
<laughs> and he voted Alfie for best picture that year. That's I thought you were going to say that your best movie going experience was the time you and your grandpa had a war. But I guess that's just mine. Well, no, that's my worst movie going experience because I had to watch my grandfather's story butchered on screen. It was not treated with the weight that I think it deserved. Um, comedies about war really shouldn't exist. Comedies about, oh, no, absolutely not. It's no laughing matter. Uh, comedies about death, comedies about war. Uh, only the Crypt Keeper would present something so twisted. Uh, folks, this is the end of our mini series on the infamous Bobby Z, Robert Zemeckis. It's been called Podcast Away. Today we're talking about The Witches, his most recent film. And I mean, what is his last? Way- not his last, not his last. I mean, look, t- just just today, Disney made it clear to us he's got another storybook adaptation coming to a streaming service soon. Yep. That's, I guess, this period of his career. And and our guest. And our guest, of course, from Vanity Fair, from Little Gold Men, from so many episodes of our show, and you know him best as the director of Trolls, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, Richard Lawson. Hello. Thanks for having me back. Was this is this eight or nine? This is nine. I've stopped keeping nine. up with Yoshida because, like, that's it's tough. It's tough. She's tough. Yoshida is currently at ten. Yoshida has hit ten. You are at nine. It's you're, you. You you also did a Patreon episode, of course. You experienced some trolls with us. I don't know if you remember this. Four thousand years ago, it was <laughs> a thing that we did in the year. 2020, which by the time this episode is coming out has now passed, but uh, we are still in it right now. Nothing feels more emblematic of the before times as a concept of we just walked into a space as three adult men, some strangers painted glitter noses on our face. Then we stepped into a wind tunnel filled with confetti and tried to catch it in plastic bags. (laughs) Did we (laughs) spread it to New York? (laughs) Is it our fault? I know. I I, I blame, think it's Branch's fault. Yeah, I was going to say, yeah. it's not our fault. You have to blame the government. Queen Poppy is the one who failed to contain this thing at the earliest stages. Absolutely. Um, here we are. We've all gathered here today on Zoom to um, discuss the witches. Roll Dolls the Witches. It seems to be irritatingly branded, like on IMDb and Letterboxd and so on. Um, don't like that. That's what uh, I'm saying, though. There's some weird Raw Doll brand initiative, and now they signed some big Netflix deal, right? I think they had a Warner Brothers deal where they were going to try to make a lot of them, and now Netflix just like signed a eight year deal, and fucking Taika Waititi is going to do a 28 part prequel Wonka. And are they going to brand the anti Semitism too, or are they going to leave that out? Did you now? Well, did you see this just this week? Striking while the iron's hot, nipping the controversy in the bud. The Raw Doll official website was updated with an apology for his anti-Semitism. Oh, well, that does it. It was the most bizarre timing. Like, just two months after the witches, what, 30 years after his death? Sure. They were just like, look, look, we got it. We cannot let this thing get out of control. We, we, yeah, maybe we should. It was like they were, like, looking at the post-its on there. I'm like, oh, sh- ah, God, someone get on the phone. I forgot oh, to apologize right. for Roald Dahl's anti-Semitism. He was a virulent anti-Semite. Right, 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 right. <laughs> God, I mean, he may have enchanted David Sims and millions of other children through his literature, but he forgot to apologize. Yeah. Uh, Roald Dahl, yes, died in 1990 at the age of 74. But he had, he did see the Rogue film, right? Yeah, like he yes, I, yes, yeah. I think he did, and he approved of it. Although he hated the ending, which this uh, movie does not, you know, repeat. This movie actually honors the original ending of the Rogue film, even though the Rogue film is totally much more in line, I would say, with what Dahl and- was going for than this. This is more sunshiny in a lot of ways. But I think it's got the inherent Dahl sort of eeriness and and cynicism it does not feel like a whitewashed film to me you're shaking your head you disagree strongly i I disagree in that this movie has a lot of antics it does and that's fine it's allowed to have antics but it's antic heavy and then at the end it just sort of cheerfully is like yeah and i'll die and and like the book has that whiplash ending and you're like oh you know when you're a kid you're just like well, that's how the book ends. Okay, like that's fine. I guess I just read that book. It's especially weird because this movie, the the new version, walks up toward a lot of sinister stuff that the 
90 movie and the book doesn't even do with like its setting and its t- its lead characters and yes and then doesn't approach. and then it doesn't do anything with that but then i rewatch the rogue version and you're like oh houston's a nazi in this right and and mm. so i don't know they're both dark but in different ways and i just think this one is a little too playful I agree, but I I also think once again it's the mouth shit. It's like so much of yeah. Zemeckis as we've covered, especially the second half of Zemeckis, Zemeckis is him just getting tempted by bad sirens in certain areas, I, and it just I, feels yeah. like he cannot resist turning half of this movie into fucking Tom and Jerry antics, starring Chloe Grace Moretz. I mean, <laughs> oh god, who else? <laughs> Part of the Jerry verse, I'm assuming. Now, does Kristen? Did, did okay? Here's a question: Did Kristen Chenoweth know she was in a movie? Absolutely no, not. No. She got turned into a mouse for reasons that we can can't get into right now. Yeah. Six months ago, completely different. You know, just and 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 then and then they just sort of made the movie around her. I mean, she's dealing with her own thing right now. It did have something to do with Aaron Sorkin, though. <laughs> yeah. It no. It, well, we can't say that. We're not. We're legally not allowed to weigh in on that, Richard. <laughs> Sorry. Hey, I know that sound. God, David. She didn't even have to call in this time. No, she's way beyond that. She's 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 a close friend at this point. The Sydney ass cow, it's like transcendence has somehow uploaded her consciousness into the internet, into the computer. That's the power of art, baby. That, that you can just start to you have magic powers. It, no, it used to be like, you know, maybe you only could hear a Sydney ass cow once every 30 days. You know, there were all these rules and structures to how it worked, but it's almost like Sydney ass cow is trying to make itself easier to understand and operate. Oh, sure. I mean, you're, so the Cineas Cow, of course, represents Mubi, the curated streaming service oh. that shows exceptional films from around the globe, longtime friends of the show. And yeah, it's simple. Look, every day they premiere a new film. That's it. A timeless classic called Favorite Acclaimed Masterpiece. That's what they got. Now, if you've heard us do Mubi ad reads before, you might be going, wait, the boys are forgetting a part of the copy. No, we're not. Because movie changed the way it operates. They're not taking movies down after 30 days. They're just adding a new movie every 30 days. And then they just stay up. I mean, yeah. Their library is just growing bigger and bigger by the day. Each and every film's hand-selected. So, you know, it's not like just this, like, fire hose no. that you have to sort through. They've got really cool uh, carousels, you know, of, like, you know, types of movies, right? Like, you know, film festival favorites or... Uh, women behind the camera, or 1970s masterpieces. You know, you're looking at the, like they got a Cannes Film Festival uh, carousel here. They've got a Top 1000, uh, the you know movie Top 1000. Like they got, they got. It's like the highest rated films. That's you know based on their community. They got all kinds of great collections to browse. Through. I mean, they got they got Martin Eden now. I didn't even realize it. They got Martin Eden now, which is one of the most acclaimed movies of the year. I still have not seen. And a lot of it is that thing of like, oh, where can I watch it? Where is it rentable? What is it's on Mubi? All you need to do is sign up for Mubi and watch Martin Eden, a thing I plan the on doing this week. Socialist. He's so we hot. We love him. We so, so, so hot. hot. Get out of here, yeah. Martin Eden. Yeah. Gonna make me a communist over here, Martin. Yeah, it's Mar- Martin Eden and Hachafar. They need to do that's what they need to do. Obviously, they're together in Old Guard, but also they should do a spin-off movie that's like Martin Eden meets Hachafar. And it's another film in which they're a couple. Well, they do battle, but then they also fall in love. Sure, sure. Uh, yeah, I'm geez, I'm just looking at the movie Top 1000 right now. Dog Tooth, El Topo, uh, Metropolis, uh, Night of the Living Dead, Romero. Oh, we should do Romero. He'd be crazy, though. It's a lot of yeah. movies. I mean, look, here are just some things that are in my personal watch list right now, okay? Yeah. I'll, t- I'll tell you what's on here, okay? Gonsborg, A Heroic Life, a movie I've only watched on a plane. I thought I should watch it properly, okay? Fake It So Real, the Robert Greene movie. She's Lost Control, The Great Pretender, Sink in Heaven. They got a lot of these Nathan Silver movies I've never seen. Amy Simons' Sun Don't Shine. Oh, Amy Simons, yeah. Yeah. That sounds good. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, look. Black Sabbath, the Mario Bava movie. They got all sorts of things. You can try Movie 3 for 30 days at movie.com slash check. Okay? That's M-U-B-I dot com slash check. You get a whole month of great cinema for free, and you're going to want to keep it. I've kept it for years. Movie is great. Always good. We love Movie. We love them. Thank you. Thank you, Cal. David, you were talking about how this movie uh, does kind of retain the more faithful ending to the book. And yes. I haven't read the book in a while. I, I don't think it was as much of a standby for me in my childhood as, as it sounds like it was for you. I was a big doll kid. 
but this wasn't my my big doll book. Um, can you remind me, the book does end with uh, the characters uh, wishing everyone a very merry Chris Mouse, right? <laughs> I believe it's have a mice Christmas. <laughs> it's both, Richard. It's both. I, I, oh, it is. Oh, okay. I forget. They, I, see, I don't remember the details. I've seen it three times. Boy, they oh, hit boy. the joke eight different times, eight very similar ways. They show eight different postcards. So, Roll Dahl actually wrote the song "We Are Family." So, but it was it was presented as something of a poem at the end of the witches. It was like the Oompa Loompa songs, where it's just like kind of like right. a limerick, right? Yeah. yeah. There's like there's Octavia Spencer is fifty years old, right? Mm-hmm. This is the only problem with the ending of this movie, even though the ending is trying to be more faithful. Octavia Spencer's 50. It is plausible that she could have a grandson, of course. Sure. But at the end of the book, the, the 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 grandma is in her late 80s. And so when she says, like, look, you're a mouse, you're going to live for a few more years, maybe a little longer because you're a magic mouse, and we'll die together because I'm old too. It's just a little weird where Octavia Spencer's like, yeah, I'll probably die in six years. I'm like, you will? You, you seem fine. <laughs> That's horrible, like, yeah. You're, what, are you going to die in your mid-50s? It's also bizarre because you're like that. That is a battle-worn mouse at the end of this movie. He sounds like Chris Rock now. He's flecked with gray. He's got some city miles on him. He's aged way more than she has. Octavia Spencer looks great. She hasn't missed a she beat. She's fine. She looks so good. <laughs> oh my god! But all that Chris Rock stuff is just they they borrowed it from Holly Noah Holly from Fargo, right? He was like, this actually doesn't work. In season why four. is why is Chris Rock in this movie? What was that decision? He's also in a new Saw movie coming up, right? Uh, a spiral from the Book of Saw, yeah, yeah. It's from the Book of Saw. Let's be right. honest, okay? Uh, the film is from the Book uh, of Saw. also by Roald Dahl. Chris Rock <laughs> Look, went Roald... to... No, go no, ahead. What are you gonna say, ahead. David? No, David, we're uh, both rushing to get to our bits. You make yours, and I'll make mine. <laughs> uh, I just wanted to say. I mean, like, I, I guess it's sort of like one of those things people don't talk about, but it is. It's sort of public knowledge. Roald Dahl was the jigsaw killer. We know that, right? (laughs) Okay. That peach that everyone's trapped in. Yeah, uh, but he only went after Jews. That was that was where they slightly modified. That's where they modified it. I'll tell you what, Jewy went after this Jew. He had my affection. I I loved his book so much, and then I remember not liking the ninety movie because it didn't fit what was in my head. But then I went back and rewatched it because of the new one and I was like oh that movie's kind of weirdly great yeah I like that movie I I watched it when I was a kid and it absolutely horrified me which I think is normal like I think a lot of kids were scarred by that movie right their parents would rent it being like oh they like the book and they put it on and go make dinner and you would just come you know never be the same again but that's what I I feel like I liked about Roald Dahl books and I I imagine that's the same for you guys we're both uh, uh, weird sensey boys uh, and those books uh, touch real nerves, of childhood fears, with a kind of startling uh, uh, clarity and uh, you know a dark humor. And I I I enjoy most Roald Dahl adaptations. It's like one of those things where I'm just sort of a sucker, I think, to some degree for even a bad Roald Dahl adaptation. Like even though this movie is not good, there are times where I it was sort of humming for me just because. It's, it's you know, it's like dollar pizza or whatever. It's still a watered-down version of a thing I inherently like a lot. Um, what I was going to say, Richard, uh, and I'm sorry, and this is something I have to say, uh, just, I, I'm sorry to drag the podcast down to a serious note for a moment, but I just mm. want you to show a little bit of respect because um, you were being kind of flippant earlier, and I just think you should know that when Chris Rock came to Lion's Day- Gate and described in chilling detail his fantastic vision that reimagines and spins off the world of the notorious Jigsaw Killer, they were all in. Oh, I see. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I, 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 I've, I've been having a lot of wrestling with, like, auteurship recently, so I guess that's probably why I wasn't as reverent to that. Ex- sure. Uh, well, I'll clear this up for you. I'll clear this up for you, Richard. Uh, Chris conceived this idea, and it will be completely reverential to the legacy of the material while reinvigorating the brand with his wit, creative vision, and passion for this classic horror franchise. I, okay. No, I'm hearing that Mank actually wrote the Book of Saw. I'm sorry. Uh, so I think I think someone's... I've, I've got to write a 50,000-word essay on this. That deadline story is almost two years old now, and it has stuck in my head. I pulled it up. I didn't know it verbatim, but I pretty much knew it. Uh, there's something about the, the description. When Chris Rock came to us and described in chilling detail. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Un- unsolicited. He just showed up to the offices. <laughs> he 
wheeled his own whiteboard in. And they were like, Chris <laughs> Rock, it's nice to see. Wait, what is that? But he had the long microphone cord <laughs> like in his stand-up. <laughs> I just imagined four <sighs> o'clock in the morning, Lionsgate Motion Picture Group chairman Joe Drake wakes up, startles awake, deep breaths, cold sweat, <laughs> turns on the light. His wife shakes, comes to, goes, Joe, Joe, honey, what is it? And he goes, I'm sorry, Nancy, I just... Chris Rock came to us today and described in chilling detail his fantastic vision that reimagines and spins off the world the notorious Jigsaw Killer. <sighs> I'm all in at this point. We just all went silent. Yeah, I want to see how long it would last. And I'm David. <laughs> there we go. Uh, it, it's weird that this movie is kind of quietly groundbreaking and that it was the first kind of damn break movie between Warner Brothers and HBO Max, right? Yes. I'm trying to think, what, what had anything gone to a streaming service earlier? I'm, I'm trying to remember the the timeline now of like what movies. Well, I, I mean specifically with the HBO Max thing, but Artemis Fowl, Artemis Fowl, Artemis Most Fowl. Of course, Artemis Fowl, yes. Mulan was before this, right? Uh, I Mulan think it was. was right before this, I think, but that was once again sort of a premium VOD thing. There was a lot of that. Oh, happening. right. Yeah, right. Sort of high end rental or purchase. Uh, uh, Artemis Fowl goes straight to Disney Plus. Um, and then there, there's stuff obviously like, uh, um, whatchamacallit. Palm Springs, but that's more a case of just like, oh, it's an independent movie, and they got shifted over to a different distributor. Right, but that was always, right, that was always going to end up on Hulu anyway. Yeah, no, no, that, that's great. I mean, that's, it's great. I love 2020. It's just great. But it, especially with the HBO Max thing, this was like, we thought, oh, Zemeckis has one March Madness. This movie is supposed to come out in theaters in October. It won't line up properly, but we'll cover it. And then when the pandemic hit and it was clear it was not going to uh, end anytime soon, we were like, OK, so what movie going will probably return uh, early 2021, end of 2020. Everything will be normal again. Uh, this movie will probably come out early 2021 and then we'll be able to cover it then. And instead, like on October 5th, they announced, hey, here's a trailer. It's going up on HBO Max in 10 days. Like it felt very sudden. And HBO Max had just debuted, right? Like it was yes. like because I remember watching this, even the screening site. I was like, "Oh, this is kind of a new experience." Like, what's an HBO Max screener like? Like, it was all very new. You remember because the the deafening cheers around the planet that greeted the launch of HBO Max had not yet died out. Like, it was still if you opened a window, just screams. It was of, like of when they joy. called Pennsylvania for Biden. I mean, it was just. <laughs> I'll never forget it. <laughs> Just horned. Like, people had vuvuzelas, and you're like, ah, is that pandemic <laughs> appropriate? But, like, I guess HBO Max is that awesome. I mean, the funny thing is HBO Max is pretty good. Yeah. Like, as a as a library. And they have Let Them All Talk, which I love, and they have... Their, their library is great, and I think their interface is decent, but they certainly had a launch uh, worthy of uh, the Challenger. Uh, <laughs> I'll, I'll say this, my, my, perhaps my favorite feature of HBO Max is I love the little clicking sounds it makes when you select things. G solid, solid clicks. Nice little yes. click. I find the color palette pleasing. Yep, and so. I do like that they're, they have sort of uh, little curated sections. I mean, people, I feel like, don't talk enough about how good the, the TCM section is. Yeah, it's really good. It, it, it's very solid. Um, you know, it's not quite as uh, good as Filmstruck was, obviously. But, you know, they, they did not, like, you know, half-ass it. They, they put some, some great stuff on there. I mean, I, we were talking about this on, 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 our, on our podcast, Little Gold Men, like, um, and it's an obvious point I'm sure you guys have made before, but, like, just the idea that they were, like, Warner Brothers films have as, as much brand recognition as Disney films, right? Like, I really feel like some institutionally, they kind of thought that was true, maybe. Yes. And people don't, I mean, most people don't know and don't need to know no. what a war. you know, it's, it's a, it was a silly bit of math. Right. Disney's the only studio where people, I mean, obviously, if you ask people on the street, have you heard of Warner Brothers? They have, but like they couldn't tell you what properties they own. They would say Bugs Bunny. Yeah, they might say Looney Tunes. Exactly. That, that's, about, that's about the one thing where the Warner Brothers logo matches with a thing in your head. 
But that's sort of, I mean, the, the key is that Disney is the only studio that has that kind of clear brand identity because they've kept such tight restrictions on the types of things they make. Like mm. Warner Brothers doesn't have a clear what is a Warner Brothers movie identity because they're a multifaceted studio that's existed for over 100 years or whatever, you know, and uh, has has made a wide array of different uh, genre films in different uh, decades. And Disney has a very clear sort of modus operandi, which now has shifted to them buying other brands and those brands have their own clear identities. And so everyone knows exactly what the different silos of a Disney movie are. I do think it's a thing I see a lot, though, with like, it makes sense from an AT&T perspective where these people are just like, people love Disney, right? So they must love Warner Brothers. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> no, I, I I, mean, I I could maybe make, I could believe an argument that said a certain generation of now young adults to people my age, which is, I'm 86. Um, I'm going to die probably <laughs> in a few years, like Octavia's character. Um, <laughs> Do you have any mouse friends? They might associate the Warner Brothers logo with the Harry Potter movies. I was, that's the one I was about to say. But even then... But, like, even that, you know, like that's a stretch. I feel like if I went up to someone and was like, you know that Warner Brothers uh, did Harry Potter, they'd be like, oh, yeah, sure. I'd be like, no, it was Universal. They'd be like, oh, yeah, I guess so. Ooh, like, like you must be the, right. That's like, where the theme park is, at Universal <laughs> right. Studios. So. Right. And there's also, like, the, the fact that the prelude of the Harry Potter theme always plays over the Warner Brothers shield. Like, I feel like people, the, yeah. there's so much a casual uh, sort of pairing in people's minds between the 20th century Fox drum roll and, and the Star opening Wars. of Star Wars. Sure. Because it right. wasn't interrupted, you know? But Warner Brothers are people, they're just already in Harry Potter land at that point. Look, this is all this is all just a great plug for our Talking Fanfare episode available on Patreon now. Yes, which we spend a good half hour talking about Warner Brothers variants, and it's 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 just a great old time. So you should listen to that. I listened to it. Even I didn't even have visual cues. I was like walking, and I was like, I don't know what you're talking about, but sure. <laughs> I hadn't seen you guys in a long time. It was nice. It's been a while. Hello. We we haven't experienced trolls in in many months now. Mm. Um, my point was just that this film got announced being punted to streaming and everyone was like yeah I, get, I mean that makes sense right i mean come on there wasn't a ton of excitement for that thing it doesn't seem like it was going to be a huge hit anyway all movies are getting pushed back warner brothers is going to have a backlog why not just put it on there for halloween give like some mid-level studio film straight to streaming to boost subscribers. We we could not have known where things were uh, trending. And I feel like just the last 10 days before we recorded this, uh, the entire industry has broken in half and this episode won't come out for another month. And I have no idea what things are going to look like in a month. I will say, I can't think of an example. Like every movie that went to streaming, Mulan was the closest and Soul, I guess, Sort of, and Wonder Woman, those are the ones where it changed. But before then, it was like if a movie got shunted to streaming, you were like, ah, it must be kind of bad. And then when you saw it, you're like, yeah, it's kind of bad. Mulan was the one where it was like, oh, but that looked good. And then you watch it and you're like, oh, it's nah, kind of bad. Whatever. Right. Yeah. Um, so I, I assume that I've seen Soul and Soul is good. Really? Uh, one, oh, yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, it's cute. I like Soul. I, 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 I I, I don't know if I'd like to know what you think of it, Griff. I, there are things okay. I didn't like about it, but there, you know, I liked Soul. It's a it's a movie. That's a proper movie that was made with thought. I mean, this episode's coming out in January, so I probably will have seen it twenty seven times by then. Yeah. Uh, and uh, Wonder Woman. You know, I don't know. Like I, whatever. You know, Buzz is pretty solid on that. But right, but before then, it was like, yeah, if they're putting it on streaming, they just kind of know it's lame. So whatever. Right. And now all movies have become uh, the Costco hot dog. It's the loss leader to just get people in the store. <laughs> and then they'll be in the store, I guess. Like, right. It's like, uh... I love the Costco hot dog uh, and I love the movies. My fear is that at some point they're going to go, why are we spending money on these fucking hot dogs? I'm not small. It's the pictures that became hot dogs. Yeah, I mean that's the issue. Nora Desmond would never survive in a in a hot dog culture. Oh God, I would love to see Nora Desmond just rip HBO Max a new one. Like Denis Villeneuve going for it, fine, that's great. <laughs> but you know, come on, come on, uh, Nora, Norma, jeez. Can you just imagine like the the AT and T assholes watching this movie and going like, I don't get it. Why isn't it eight one hour installments? Like, to them, this just must seem like, why did we ever make this? The only value this would have is in several 22-minute installments or whatever. 
Right. Um, you know, I said Denis Villeneuve. I know his name is Villeneuve because there was the Formula One racer, Jacques Villeneuve. I don't know why I always say his name wrong. Anyway, yeah, so I just really wanted to get that out in the open. Um, hey, Richard. Hey, Griffin. How you doing? This movie was written by Robert Zemeckis, Kenya Barris, and Guillermo del Toro. The three best friends. We're hashtag the two friends. They're hashtag the three best friends. <laughs> they're, they're closer than you guys are. Yeah, so much closer. This film was produced by Alfonso Cuaron. I guess I can tell you why. I guess we might as well do some context. Yeah. I assume you know this, Griffin, but this was initially planned as a stop-motion film that was going to be directed by Guillermo del Toro mm -hmm. and produced by Alfonso Cuaron. And then I guess it got put down and never picked up again until Zemeckis picked, I guess, like some remnant of that project up because Del Toro and Cuaron's name are on it. When did he, when did Zemeckis come and in, become involved? Because I'm just curious about like how much of a long-term passion project this was for him or if it was just like something to no, do. No, no. Like the, 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 the Del Toro plans were in 2008, which was back when he had like 40 movies spinning, right? Like post Pan's Labyrinth. Do you ever read that New Yorker article about that? About yes, him. it's so good. It's fascinating because like every project he mentions never came to fruition, pretty much. Uh, and um, the uh, Zemeckis was announced that he was going to, you know, write and direct in 2018. So you know, he just whatever. And much like all the Zemeckis projects, Griff, we've covered recently, it's like right before his movie is about to come out. So this is before Marwin is coming. It's like anyway, Zemeckis has set up his next thing. It's this thing yeah. you've heard of. And he's going to work on it. And it's going to have a star and blah, blah, blah. Right. He's just announcing this. Right. It, it's going right away. He's launching straight into the next one. I feel like around that same time was the story that Warner Brothers wanted him to direct Flash. And he was like, yes, fuck no. Get that out of my face. He said that about Ezra Miller. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Get that out of my face. But but he it did seem like perhaps Warner Brothers was actively courting him. You know, that they wanted him to make something for them. And so maybe after he passed on Flash, they were like, here are properties we have that have just sat on a shelf for 10 years. Right. Are you had, Do you have any interest? Right. Because Marwin is universal. Allied is Paramount. The Walk was Sony. Flight was um, Paramount as well. You know, like he had kind of been dancing around. Christmas Carol is Disney, right? Beowulf is Warner Brothers and Paramount together, maybe? like he, Yeah, Paramount Domestic, Warner Brothers International. He's, you know, he has no loyalty to any particular, you know, uh, shop. He's just sort of moving around, getting stuff going, bounce, you know, not re not making total bombs, but not also making hits and right it's it's he's just yeah. he's robert zemeckis but i feel like disney and warners have in particular been courting him for the better part of the last decade i mean disney pushed him away uh you know through an old regime with the stop uh the stop motion the motion capture stuff but i feel like they've been trying to lure him back into the fold because they are the the you know the big budget Miracle Weaver people. So there's an obvious fit there. And uh, Warner Brothers, I think just up until, uh, you know, two weeks ago was viewed as the most filmmaker friendly of the major studios. It made sense that they saw value in sort of a blue chip, um, you know, big budget filmmaker like that. But uh, yeah, it's kind of weird that this movie was greenlit. It's one of these things where now, isn't it bizarre how just nine months of the pandemic, the growing sort of just uh, acceptance that most things are going to end up being made for or ultimately going to streaming has changed the way we perceive most movies? Where I just watch this now and I'm like, I can't believe they ever thought this was a thing they were going to put in theaters and people were going to see. But then I also think, in, if this had come out a year ago, I guess it would have made like $50 million. Yes, it would have made money because it would have been a thing in theaters. It would have been, it's rated PG, like almost surprisingly. Not but in tone, it is a PG, but it is, you know, on the edge there. Um, and, you know, people would have taken their kids, right? And been like, yeah, sure. Yeah, with Roll Doll, I've heard of that. Everything is just rendered a little flimsier, you know, and I know it's like right. a trite thing to say, but because like we have to get used to it. I'm just not fully, I mean, certain things it's, you know, it, it depends on the movie, but this one is just like, it just loses, I hate to use this overused term, it just loses all of its clout 
being just, be, you know, at home re- whenever you want to watch it, you know? And that's that's kind of all this movie has going for it, right? I mean, you watch it and you're just like, this thing does have high production value. You're watching someone who does understand the craft of filmmaking, hiring like like top below the line people, you know, with money applied to the right places. Uh, and, uh, you know, a cast of very capable actors, at least three leads who are very game. Uh, but then you watch this uh, at home and it just all of that is like sucked out by the fact the movie in and of itself does not have a ton of interest. But, uh, you know, the joy you'd get from it would just be watching, I guess, I don't know, these sets on a big screen. Uh, yeah. Also, you got to remember that this film um, uh, banded, collaborated with uh, Roblox, the uh, the iPad game. Is that true? To uh, to include a boss battle, which is the Grand High Witch. So that 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 was also a big thing, that uh, big innovation. <laughs> <So> depressing <laughs> for this for this oh movie. God. It's all just a little depressing. And uh, you know, I know that in Griffin and I's uh, dynamic, he's the more more of the doomsayer, and I'm more of the well, things will be all right. And we did just sit. The thing is, the Disney thing. I just I didn't even watch it, but I sat through the the waves of it. You know, and I, I was texting you all the stories. Was texting yeah. me. And like the thing, I, I was having this experience where they're like, and we're we're proud to announce that yes, you're you're the wait is over, and finally it's going to happen. We're going back to Atlantis, the Lost Empire, Atlantis. <laughs> you know, like we're just everything. You're just like, uh huh. It's a sequel or a remake or okay. And but then they're like, but it's in theaters, and I'm like. Well, it's it's good that they're putting things in theaters. Like the, I I I have to have the kind of uh, the the low bar. Like okay, well that's that's something. I guess that'll be good. Can I ask you guys a question about the Disney presentation? Because I didn't see it. Um, is the Buzz Lightyear remo- movie going to be about the toy? Great question. Oh, Jesus, Richard. you really fucked up here asking a question like that. You really showed your ass. Whoa, it was an honest I gotta, question. I just don't know. I just really don't know. Okay, Richard, listen. How do I even put this? The toy Buzz Lightyear from Toy Story. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, yeah, 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 yes. no yeah. we understand. We understand, Richard. Oh, I, God, I don't even have the words. Intense. Look, okay, let me so, just put I mean, it this way, okay? Just I guess you don't know clear, about our nation's history. I, I Griffin mean, just took like, off his I wig and you... shoes. <laughs> <laughs> this isn't Buzz Lightyear the toy. This is the origin story of the human Buzz Lightyear <laughs> that the toy is based on Richard get that through your head I I am it's like I just discovered witches are real I'm so blown away (laughs) can we unpack that though what the hell does that so in the in the world of Andy the child from Toy Story there are like actual like adventuring spacemen oh there he is (laughs) David's back he looks so like angry what if like it turns out Toy Story is set in like 2022, you know, like or 2222. You know, it's like <laughs> like it, it, it all been happening in the far future and Andy lives in some fucking Andy's been on the hollow deck the whole time. <laughs> right. <laughs> Buzz Lightyear from Star Command, obviously. Like, because it's not like there's a Neil Armstrong from Star Command toy. That's not a thing. We didn't no. license the actual human and then put him in a sci-fi universe. <laughs> Well, branding thing. Go ahead. Can we unpack this for a second? Richard asked. I, I promise I won't stay on this for too long. Sure. I had a friend with an inside scoop text me, get ready. There's one thing during the Disney Investor Day that's going to break your brain. This was Chris Evans texting you? It was Chris <laughs> Evans. And he said, I have no words, just to be clear. One thing during this Investor Day will break your brain. No, but my friend said like, I don't know if you're going to be very happy or very angry. <laughs> and I immediately said, it has to be some weird Pixar thing, right? It has it's to be some be. weird Pixar thing. But my brain was sort of like processing it. And I was like, I don't think it would just be them doing another sequel to something. It has to be some odd approach they're taking. Is there going to be some weird TV show version of something? What am I not considering here? And then it came up on the screen. And the reason I hadn't considered it is because they've done this already. Oh, because you mean, are you referring to the the Buzz Lightyear Starkman was a Saturday morning cartoon show after the release of Toy Story 2 that purported to be this is the cartoon show that Andy watches. The right. toy that Andy owns is a piece of tie-in merchandise to this cartoon show. It was an enjoyable cartoon show. 
Pixar had no involvement. It was very much in the days of Disney being like, yunk, thank you for making that movie. We'll do with this what would please. It was it was two dimensional, but it did not really address the fact of you know that we all knew because we all went to school that yeah, Blow Buzz Lightyear was a real person who also had space adventures. Well, this not is what I with Star cannot Command. figure out. The way they said it in the Disney press conference just made it sound like I mean, Pete Doctor was saying like when we created Toy Story, we established that Buzz Lightyear was a character in that universe that the toy was based off of. That's not true though, right? He, they're saying what he's saying is internally. Uh huh. Oh, sure. Our, like our they always had was. that. You don't know. They live. It lives in Canada. You've never met them. This idea that we've <laughs> always secretly had. <laughs> David, we do know that because the opening of Toy Story Two is the video game where you see that obviously yes. Buzz Lightyear exists in other mediums. And the opening of Toy Story One that was deleted was supposed to be a similar opening with Andy watching the cartoon show. No, I have no problem with him being. Of course, he's a toy that's based on. I can understand that, but they are now saying he's a real person. This is my point. Let me say this, right. David. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So my point is, Pete Doctor said it in a way that sounds like what we're saying. On the stream, he was like, when we created the world Toy Story, we all always believed that Buzz Lightyear was a character that existed that the toy is based off of. It felt like he was framing it as, this is like the movie that Andy would see. And then Chris Evans comes out with his tweet where he's like, the real guy. And I can't tell if that's just weird wording choice because they're trying to make it clear like, no, 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 we're not being rude to Tim Allen. It's a different character. Right. Or if this movie is going to be like a, a first man. Or if Chris Evans has broken with reality and really does not right. know. Like Kristen Chenoweth does not know <laughs> what a movie is. Because I'll be honest, I don't want to see a hyper-realistic Buzz Lightyear movie. I'm down to see them do some wacky fucking sci-fi movie that is sort of straight-faced and earnest, and the idea is that it's like, this is the thing that Andy likes. But I don't I don't want to see anything gritty, which I don't, I can't imagine that's what they're doing, and implying that this is like a real American hero rather than some sort of like, you know, square-jawed, uh, you know, matinee serial icon is uh, the question for me. It is the question. It's a question that, of course, will be answered in um, Jill, on June seventeenth, twenty twenty two, when Lightyear hits theaters. Who's directing Lightyear? You told me, Angus McLean, who's the guy within the Pixar house who I've most been waiting to see direct a film. He did Toy Story of Terror and uh, Small Fry, and he did Bernie, which is a very good short. And I think he's a good director. I'm excited that he gets to make a movie. I don't. I beyond that, I don't even know what to think of this or what to think of uh, anything anymore. What were you going to say, Richard? Oh, I was just going to say that we're going to find out that uh, Infinity was the name of his sled as a child. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> boy. That's how he went to Infinity. Mank. And beyond. And now I changed my background to light year as well. Yeah, Mank. Oh, there. Now it's both. Now it's So it's two Buzz Light years and then my extra room in my apartment. So, so I don't have the background <laughs> capabilities. That's all right. I'll 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 switch back to the stupid witches. Griffin there had he is, oh. of course, the Grand High Witch. <laughs> you know, when this airs, uh, when this podcast goes out, we will have seen maybe the Matthew Morrison Grinch. And so this Absolutely. could be playing to just like no one. I mean, we could all be gone. Didn't it air <laughs> last night? Am I wrong? Oh, did it? I, have no, I, have I no think idea. it aired last night and no one watched it. Oh, dear. I feel like I saw that headline today that was like the Grinch watched by literally zero people. If I said that Matthew Morrison is the Grinch looks like Joanna Kearns from Growing Pains, would you know what I meant? Absolutely. Yes. <laughs> Can I say also, when the story hit that Matthew Morrison was going to do a live TV version of The Grinch, I read the headline very quickly as Matthew McConaughey to play The Grinch, and I got so <laughs> amped. The idea of Matthew McConaughey yeah, doing good. like a live TV musical Grinch. That's a curveball. That, that's, that's fun. That's a curveball. Like, exactly. Matthew McConaughey's Grinch telling Cindy Lou Who that the left has gone too far. <laughs> <laughs> right. Your background is from future blank check subject, Oz the Great and Powerful, right? Yeah, of course. My background is the witches. I only stand two witches in this house, and it's uh, Mila Kunis and Michelle Williams. I forgot that movie existed. 
wasn't Rachel Vice a witch in that one as well? Do you, you don't acknowledge her? She's the third witch. She doesn't really do that much in the movie. <laughs> cool. Sounds like a cool movie. Can't wait. To yeah, talk also, about I couldn't it. find a good picture of all three of them. Have you not seen it, David? <laughs> I've never seen Oz the Great and Powerful. No, the because of a binding legal uh, arrangement. I don't know what the joke is there. <laughs> um, the witches. Here's the mm. thing about the witches. Uh, Roald Dahl's book, The Witches, is pretty weird. It's about a little boy, as you say, who encounters these witches who are real, who are bald, who have chicken hands, who have uh, square toeless feet, who uh, uh, smell, think children smell disgusting and want to turn them into mice. And you have to recognize them by the fact that they like wear lots of jewelry and gloves and fancy shoes, you know, like. And even as a kid, when I read it, I was like, this book's kind of like fucked up about women. Seems kind of <laughs> mad at women. Like, what, yeah, what, what is yeah. what is that? And yeah, wh- what's, his, what's his problem with these women? Are they Jews or something? <laughs> <laughs> and that's just, you know, it, it, that's just something that every and as you say, I feel like Rogue is like, yeah, right. This is about like the evil that lurks within little england like right you know these are nazis these are Mm. terrible right you know like i get that i get that in this one i guess they're so the the movie the choice that this movie makes that we talked about but that is hard to dig into because the movie doesn't really want to dig into it is that it's set in uh, uh, alabama Mm -hmm. yes in the 50s or the 60s 1960s yes in the in like 68 uh, it, it's made the lead, you know, the, the 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 story is set in Britain. It's made the lead character black. It's made the grandma black. And that's kind of all it has decided to do with that, right? There is one line where the grandmother books the hotel and she's like, well, you know, I know the, the cook at the hotel and we got a room there. Uh, and he's like, why would we go there? And she's like, because it's full of rich white people and the witches only prey upon children who are poor or otherwise kind of forgotten about. No one will miss right. them if they're gone. So there is a statement of political intent, I would have to imagine, uh, you know, that was like carefully talked about in the writing of the movie, but then nothing is done with that no. for the rest of the movie. It also is bizarre when the first witch our character encounters in the movie is also black. I was, right, this is the other thing. I was like, oh, is there like something where, right, you know, there's, uh, the witches are these kind of like nice, genteel white ladies who are, you know, but like now the, the 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 witches themselves in the movies are, you know, there's there are all kinds of people of color and like you know there, there's no, there's nothing going on there. Then that's not that that again. If if they wanted to go there, they they didn't. They, they there's didn't a little of the like more female guards at Guantanamo kind of thing there. Where it's like, it's like, <laughs> right. what is the representation doing? And, and, um, and I just, don't, I, th- I think that like, I don't know, it's, it's tricky because uh, the movie isn't really making any political points, but it kind of sets up maybe no. that it will and then it doesn't. So. But, but you're right. It's like the, the uh, I mean, it's, it, it's, uh, <sighs> it's one of those cases where you're like, the movie is more effective if all the witches are white. To a certain degree, because then there's a statement of intent, you know, about race relations in the 60s. Right. It would be a very clanging statement. It's not like it would be, but like, right, then it would at least be something. It's funny. The screenplay is credited to Robert Zemeckis, Ampersand, Kenya Barris, and Guillermo del Toro. So I think del Toro's influence is barely right like that's just whatever lingered from the original script it's Zemeckis and he brings in Kenya Barris and he's like I assume they're the ones like let's transpose this to Alabama let's have the lead character be black but but do you have that confirmed that he brought Kenya Barris in because that was my question was obviously there's the lingering Coran del Toro of the whole thing Warner still has the rights my question was does at some point Kenya Barris get hired on to take a pass at the witches and that's what gets Zemeckis on board? Or does Zemeckis sign up just for the idea of do you want to make a witches movie and then Kenya Barris is hired? I All I know is that they are credited as working on it together. And uh, when the film was announced, uh, it was very much announced as Kenya Barris is on board to co-write the script with Zemeckis. So it wasn't announced as like Zemeckis's 
making a movie of this can you bear a script and then Zemeckis's name gets added later like you know so so yeah so I assume like either they wrote a thing and then eventually it just sort of got watered down and here's the result or I don't know maybe they thought that that was kind of interesting enough just to sort of change the setting and it just wasn't interesting enough because the 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 the, the themes of the witches are interesting but the plot of the witches like you guys said is pretty simple so if you're gonna mess with it you would need to mess with it and they don't it's also fascinating i mean i remember when we were talking about even the idea of doing zemeckis like a year or two ago when they announced this movie pre-march madness we were like he's doing the witches now and it's it's like voodoo inspired and you and i turned to each other and we were like what's he doing there and then you watch it and you're like he's not really doing anything there are like these little glimpses of like that's almost a take he almost wants to turn it into like a civil rights movie. He almost wants to turn it into like more of a class thing. He almost wants to turn it into this or that. And it'll, you'll just get like the vestiges of one scene where sort of lip service is paid to something. Which makes me wonder, and maybe you guys have more insight into this than I do, probably you do, is why then does Zemeckis want to do this? Because the social message gets muddled and not really addressed special effects wise which has seemed to have, seems to have been his like major preoccupation of the last 20 years like sure there's some stuff with hathaway but like and the mice but like that's pretty pedestrian stuff at this point um so it just it feels confusing about why he's there at all you know i i agree it's not uh like anything else in his filmography really and it's not like he gets to push any sort of technological boundaries it doesn't feel like he's breaking any new ground here and even though pinocchio is a little bit lateral to this you're like well i get thematically what zemeckis likes about pinocchio maybe it's one of those things where you just he someone just gets like a, a one image fixated in their head and like i have to see that to fruition or something like the, the the arms extending down the air shaft or something i don't know but like there's just so little that feels even in this like late stage of his like weird career that feels signaturely his, you know? But I also feel like, to some degree, he is a guy who wants to keep making movies. And to some degree, it feels like they send him a pile of scripts, he's still got enough juice, and maybe that's about to run out, to if he signs on to something, they go, sure, here's between 30 and 60 or $80 million to make your thing. Uh, and he'll just pick the thing that maybe seems the most doable at that moment. Like, it, it's it's odd, you know. We've talked about how the, the uh, Tim Burton selection process feels kind of so dispassionate at this point. It really just feels like, what's the most recent thing that was sent to me, you know? And then you have someone like Spielberg who, you know, runs different a different calculus for each project, it seems like, but is very aware of, like, I get to make one Spielberg movie a year and I'm going to make it count. And what's a Spielberg movie going to be? What's a thing I haven't done before? Or people I haven't worked with before? Whatever it is. And then the Zemeckis stuff is is odd. I, I mean, all the post-mocap choices are weird. Yeah. I don't disagree. I'm just noticing also that the Matthew Morrison Grinch looks a little bit like Kate Mulgrew. Is that track? <laughs> Yeah, sure. <laughs> oh my God! Ring, ring. Oh, the the phone is ringing. Hello, hello, fresh. Okay, hello, fresh. What's the deal with the fresh? What? That you're Jerry Seinfeld? That's what this is. Hello, fresh. Wait, you called me. Cold called me. Said hello, fresh. And now you're revealing that you're Jerry Seinfeld? I was confused. I thought you were calling me. And you were fresh. And it wasn't a phone call. It was a knock at the door. I'm I'm a little fresh, I will say. I can be a little fresh. Well, in that case, hello, fresh. Hello, fresh. They're friends of the show. Okay, look, it's 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 a great meal kit service. America's number one meal kit. Of course. This is not this is not the time to be going to the grocery store all the time, guys. Home cooking, you can make it easy and fun and affordable right now. It comes right to your door rather than you having to browse around outside. You know I, what I'm saying? I went to the grocery store and there was a woman. She had the mask down underneath her nose. She was a nose masker. A nose masker, Jerry. Look, 
HelloFresh cuts out all that stressful meal planning, all the grocery store trips. You can enjoy cooking and get dinner on the table in 30 minutes or less. Okay, they got 23 recipes each week with a range of flavors, cuisines, and ingredients. You're never going to get bored. I just realized I ended my last statement with Jerry. Okay. I'm very disoriented. I thought you were fresh. I thought I was at my door. I thought I was speaking to Jerry. That's me. That is you, I guess. I'm discombobulated. Well, look, Jerry, if you want to cut down on grocery bills and food waste, get HelloFresh. They have pre-portioned ingredients. You're not overbuying, which is a burden on the planet and your wallet. And they have, you know, a very eco-friendly packaging. Uh, HelloFresh, it always arrives. And th- the best thing about it is exactly that. You're never, like, making too much food and not finishing it and feeling guilty about it. This week, I made... I mean, it's a favorite of mine, but the brown sugar bourbon pork chops with the apple pan sauce and the scallion mashed potatoes. It's a pretty good one. Um, let's see what else, what else is coming out. Game day barbecue ribs. I want to make Hello Fresh ribs. That sounds good. Are you excited, Jerry? I know you're not a big cook, so I feel like this is going to be huge for you. No, I mostly eat cereal and Ray Liotta private select honey. <laughs> so, Jerry, go to HelloFresh.com slash blank check 10. You can use code blank check 10 for 10 free meals, including free shipping. That's HelloFresh.com slash blank check 10 for 10 free meals, including free shipping. It's America's number one meal kit. Jerry. Wait a second. They send it to you in the mail? Yeah, that's the premise. Jeez. Is no man going to deliver it? He might. This is the thing I find interesting. I I would say, other than Pinocchio, obviously, Flight, The Walk, Allied, Marwin, Witches, the thing that unifies them all is they probably were never going to get greenlit unless Robert Zemeckis signed on to do them. Right. By and large, yes. The witches may be the closest, but yes, exactly. Like, we talk about the the Burton process is perplexing only because you look at those movies and you're like, dude, anyone could make those. Like, let a fucking special effects supervisor direct these movies. But the Zemeckis movies are, like, odder projects that are a little less obvious, but they're they're getting to see the light of day solely through the sheer will of Zemeckis anointing it. Okay, so now that you guys are at the end of the series, what has been the most recent film that earned him that? Do you know what I mean? Like, what? Why does he still keep getting the blank checks? I mean, this or is blank the thing. It, 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 it's literally Polar Express. I would say is the last movie he made that surpassed expectations. That's the last one that didn't lose money, right? I mean, well, a flight, a flight made money, but that's the last one that was a real hit. And that was a while ago now, wasn't it? That was like over 10 years ago? It was 16 years ago. Yeah, but I mean, if you think about the fact that it lives on in your mind and, you know, I was on the that bells ring I mean, for yeah. us. But, but to answer your question, Richard, I don't even think, I, I think, you know, Disney was making the Christmas Carol movie because they were like, oh, what if he gave us another Polar Express? I think Polar Express isn't in anyone's minds anymore. Despite the fact that that movie somehow illogically continues to make money year after year, seems to be an infinitely profitable movie for Warner Brothers. I don't think anyone hires him with the expectation that he's going to do that again, especially since the mocap thing has sort of been so roundly rejected overall. You know, maybe that's why he's going more into children's films now, because that was his last blockbuster. But it does just feel to some degree that it's it's Back to the Future, Roger Rabbit, and Forrest Gump. It's like those three movies have given him a lifetime pass that short of the theatrical exhibition business going under made it difficult for him to ever stop having green light power. And there's probably, I would imagine, some loyalty given that he, you know, he came a little bit later, but like, you know, that he and Spielberg and a couple other people were really like invented the economy of Hollywood for so many years, like, or helped to do it, you know? Absolutely. There are always going to be huge actors who want to work with him. He's always going to be able to get some sort of A-list movie star. And I think another factor is you have the executives, you know, maybe not the people at the very top of the studios, but the people who are at the levels just below that are now the kids of Zemeckis. They're people who grew up with Zemeckis and I think they go, oh, my God, Robert Zemeckis wants to make a movie. I like I'm the junior whatever at 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 whatever fucking studios. And I'm 40 years old. And those movies like were my childhood, you know, it's like why I mean, it's why we have 
such a particular brand of nostalgia online, it's because, well, it's all the people in their mid-30s who run the internet now. And, right. And, and that's, their, that's their culture. So, yeah, it really is a generational thing. I think you're right. Th- that's the exact shift. You're, right. The, the internet is run by children of the 90s and is now starting to slip into being children of the early 2000s, right? Not if I can help it. Hey, hey now. And... But the studios are still pretty much the the high level decision making is being done by children of the eighties, and so these eighties guys, even if some of them seem like dinosaurs now, still hold a lot of sway with the people who ultimately have the rubber stamps. But I wonder, like, does the witches feel like in any way that that's going to slow that moment? I mean, he, I mean, time itself will slow it for him. But like, I don't think the witch the witches feels like a little bit value neutral, right? It doesn't feel like it was. It feels for him absolutely for him. value neutral, it's especially because it came out on HBO Max. I think even if he had come out in theaters, it would have performed like a lot of these Zemeckis movies, where it's like, oh, that sort of disappointed, but I guess wasn't a total bomb. Like, I think that probably would have been the story of the witches. Instead, even you know, it's on HBO Max. It's like whatever. Pinocchio is going to be on Disney Plus again whatever well and and to, which which le- and i'm sorry to keep digressing but like which leads me to another question that i've been meaning to ask you guys is i know in certain cases it was really just and and going forward it's going to be more of that where it's like there just aren't theaters open we have to put things on streaming is how many movies do you think are going to are, are have have been, gone on streaming or are going to that in some ways are strategic choices to hide potential failure you know what i mean high like, bombs yeah like you, you can kind of launder the movie and be like well we don't have to report on any box office so like mulan did really well you know or whatever it's weird richard i feel like now we're experiencing the flip i i feel like the recent hbo go hbo max announcement which at this point when you folks are listening to it will be old news feels like a switch flip where it went from being oh, if a movie was probably going to underperform in theaters, we can punt it to streaming and write it off as a success based on whatever metric we've just created. And now it feels like it's shifting to we put our biggest movies on streaming as like a loss leader to boost To get people streaming. to streaming. Right. right. And to some degree, the stuff that's middling is like you give that a new mutants release. You know, right. people are going to start getting vaccinated. You put it in 500 theaters. It makes $10 million. No one talks about it. You know, it's like it, it's somehow if you want a movie to quietly die, you put it in theaters. If you want it to actually be in a pole position, you put it on your streaming service. New Mutants, which I traveled to another state and stayed in a hotel to see. Wow. Before Labor Day or after Labor Day, I don't remember. But I, I was really I was really going to Boston to see Tenet, but like I I I also uh saw New Mutants at, at a very completely empty AMC in downtown Boston. Did you like it? N- New Mutants is very bad. It's no, no, mm, no, no. That's no. too bad. No. But the mutants, they're so new. They're very new. We can also talk, by the way, um, because this will be out later, is um I just watched some screeners of speaking of Josh Boone of The Stand, the CBS All Access, it is a turkey. It is very bad. That guy's got a weird career. I was, I'm not surprised. It's not like that thing had like, you know, big buzz, but that's, I'd love someone to do The Stand right someday. It's certainly not an easy one to do. Um, yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, it's like to some degree the, talking about this movie at the moment we're talking about it just becomes an excuse to talk about the state of what movies are, even are these days. Right. Because this movie is is weirdly at this big it's 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 in and of itself a transition point, this film and a, a story, you know, as as the tea leaves have been like sort of like coming out on the on the HBO Max thing. One of the scoops that came out recently is that um, they offered at least Hathaway and Zemeckis a big buyout to put this up on streaming, right? Like, people this A-list have big back-end deals based on theatrical release. And also, they contractually don't want to be seen as being in a movie or having made a movie that's getting punted straight to video so that it's like contractually you have to put the movie in theaters. So they wanted to put this on streaming. It's clear theaters were not going to be healthy anytime soon. They paid Zemeckis and Hathaway a lot of money. I would imagine they probably paid Octavia Spencer as well. Uh, uh, Chris Rock probably got $15 million. Um, 
And then Wonder Woman got a similar deal. Sounds like even more yep. lucrative. Big deal. 10 million bucks to each of Jenkins and Godot. Yeah. But, but I mean, Zemeckis and Hathaway got millions of dollars. They got yeah, more yeah, they than got what payouts. this movie's value yeah, probably yeah, yeah. was. Right. And then a big part of the, the new announcement for all the 2021 movies is that that's not happening. Or if it is happening, it was not negotiated. It was not told to any of these people. And, uh, you know, they, they have this weird strategy now where it's, the movies are going on HBO Max and in theaters on the same day. Then it will play on HBO Max for 30 days. Then they take it off HBO Max. And then they put it on like premium rental and whatever. And it's maybe still lingering in theaters depending on if it's been a hit. Right. And then it will eventually come back to HBO Max like a year later. And uh, someone who understands the industry better than I do uh, uh, you know, uh, off the record said to me that their theory on why they're structuring it this way is if they, they do that, if you send it just straight to streaming, you have to offer these people who made a movie under the understanding that it was going to go theatrical, a buyout, right? You have to offer them compensation for not leaving them the potential to make profits. Exactly. You have to buy out their profit participation. And if you do it this way, you can be like, what do you mean? The movie's in theaters. But the thing that they didn't think was that it was ridiculous not to tell these people that they were going to do right. this without, you know. But even crazier than that to then say, like, look, I mean, I'm sorry. We put it up on iTunes. It's only made $15 in rentals. There's no money to share. And it's like $15 in rentals because it was on HBO Max for a month. Why would anyone rent it? Look, Warner Brothers was run by people who got scammed <laughs> in public reported uh, crazy uh, blackmail things. It's uh -huh. now run by a telephone company uh -huh. that every article you write about it was like essentially like, you know, someone was like, well, here's what we should do. And the other guy was like, yeah, but what about Netflix? That thing's got so much fucking shit on it. We need to go now. Like, you know, like they were just sort of like, ah, Netflix. So I just don't think any of these decisions are being made with like expert strategy. It's just panic. And what can we get away with to what extent, right? Like, that seems to be what's happening. Now. And again, that's not what happened with the witches. The witches, they were more like, oh, this is a good situation to put this on. We'll, 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 we'll pay everyone out. Yeah. It's all short term. And it's all just like their only two numbers they care about seeing go up, which are their subscriber growth and their share price. And those two things are like intrinsically linked to them. And AT&T sees the, a symbiotic relationship between, oh, people are paying for AT&T internet and they're watching HBO Max and we give them one for free for getting the other one or whatever it is, but we're controlling the pipe and we're controlling the water that runs through the pipe or whatever. But it's not very big picture thinking. And they're probably going to 18 months from now go like, why are we making movies and TV shows, this is stupid. We could just make cell phones for the rest of our life. Or there whatever. probably was know. some shrewd calculus, though, in that, like, if they'll come for Anne Hathaway, they'll stay for Anna Kendrick. Uh, true. Do you know what I mean? Now, this this leads me to my next question, guys. Because, again, we're not talking about the plot of the witches. He, look, he turns into a mouse. There's witches. You know, they, they kind of sneak like in this one. That covers it, right? Yeah. Anne Hathaway. Uh-huh. Post Oscar, one it's of the most covered actors on this show. Right, we, we I mean, talked about her plenty. She's she's worked with more blank check filmmakers than she hasn't. I think at this right because we we've done Brokeback Mountain, Devil Wears Prada, uh, Rachel Getting Married, Alice in Wonderland, Dark Knight Rises, Interstellar, The Intern, and The Intern. And your next your next season is a ten episode series about Ella Enchanted. Uh, correct. That's right. Correct. It's called Griffin, Griff, Griff, Dave Griff Enchanted. Dance and the Dancy. <laughs> but, but yes, so, the last five years of her career have essentially been disastrous. So, right. This is the thing. So, it, it's, it's gone from, oh, to what's going on. So, she wins the Oscar for Les Mis. That's 2012 film. At that point, there's that sort of backlash. We've discussed it. What, you know, a lot of it unfair. But that's the, you know, the that was the... And she hosts the... You know, anyway, okay. She takes a little bit of a break. And then in 2014, she does Interstellar, which I think is one of her better performances. You know, uh, working with a big director. Makes sense. And then 2015, she does The Intern, which again, we've talked about. Working with a major female director. 
pretty solid hit, right? Uh, yeah, and a masterpiece, and a modern American masterpiece. Good movie. She's good in it. You know, that movie has its thing. But yeah, right? Richard, I don't know where you are on the intern, Richard. Oh, yeah. No, I mean, I like the intern. Yeah. I t- I've told on this podcast the story of Bobby Finger meeting Nancy Myers at the intern uh, yeah. premiere party. That No, that was good for Anne Hathaway, without a doubt. Yes. Even though people were going for De Niro, but she was, you know. But then this is the turning point. Right. So, so far post-Oscar, you're like, okay, she's she's picking projects. and yeah, okay. All right. So 2016, she has Alice through the looking glass. She's barely in that, but she is, I suppose, obligated to be in that. We can't really hold that against her. She's like above the title. I mean, you know, she's second build. Like the, the movie is is being sold partially on her shoulders, even if it's not her fault. Right. But, you know, but whatever. That she's also in Colossal, which is not a movie I loved, but I thought it was pretty good. I really like that movie. I, I like that movie. Some people really loved yeah. it. Yes. I think she's very good in it. Yes. Fun choice. She's good in it. Like, you know, interesting little movie. So even then you're like, okay. And then two year break. And then she's in Ocean's 8, which I think is a not good movie. But she was kind of, the by consensus, the best liked part of it. Right? Yeah. Yeah. She has one really great scene very improbably with James Corden. Yes. yes. I mean, which which only makes the scene more impressive. Well, exactly. Uh, but yes, no, she's very good in that. She's arguably the best performance in the movie. Uh, Aquafina is obviously the only person who kind of pops from that movie just because she was having such a moment. And it was like the groundswell of several things happening at the same time. I don't know that the woman who played the computer hacker, I'd be interested to see what her career is going to be like, you know, like maybe music or something. Yeah. I think she's good in that movie. Yeah. No, I, yeah, I, I mean, I like her better in Battleship. Well, she's but. great in Battleship. Battleship's like a real character, though. I mean, it's not, it's I not. I mean, Mahalo, motherfucker. It's, you know. Yeah. So 2019, she has three films. One of them is Dark Waters, which is one of the best movies of that year. Her role in it is, is what it is. But, you know, she like, did it to whatever. work with Todd Ains. Yeah. And also, it, it, clearly, being in that movie it makes you tax exempt or something. There, there had to be some. <laughs> well, it gets the movie made for one thing. It helps get the movie, and made. so that Absolutely. was like it was like a noble act. Yeah, that's that's a generosity of her extending her movie stardom to a worthy cause to work with good people on a, a good subject. That's a great movie. She was paying Mark Ruffalo back for all the fracking she'd done. <laughs> <laughs> but but we all agree that is a thankless role perform to yeah. the best of her ability. I think she's actually good in it. I, I, I do but, too. Yeah, it's not I the most too. exciting role. Yeah, Bill Camp is the is the star of that movie, though. Absolutely. Putters and Mermaid. Oh, God, he's so good. He, she's in, uh, and I tweeted this, but I have to say it, in The Queen's Gambit, Bill's, Bill Camp plays a big part of The Queen's Gambit. And in the first, and I had no idea he was in it, and in one of the first scenes of the show, you see him out of focus, not his head, just his body, like he's a janitor and he's like mopping a floor and I was like that's Bill Camp I know Bill Camp's like shambling figure when I see it and that's Bill Camp I can't wait wow. for more camp that's how that's what he, the greatest character you recognized reference. his gait you recognized yeah, exactly. his gait like you were the fucking you were the security system in Mission Impossible Ghost Protocol recognizing his posture and it's one of those things where like yeah, the, the show's been running for five minutes. It's got kind of an air of Bill Camp to it. I'm like, this is the kind of thing Bill Camp might be in. And then he <laughs> like these sort of <laughs> anyway. Um she's in the hustle, which I think is one of those movies that was made a while ago, right? Like it was sort of a on the shelf for a second. Yeah. We should also mention the two year gap where she doesn't make a movie is birth of her first child. Right. In between Colossal and Ocean's Eight. Yeah. Here's the thing the hustle. I think technically was a hit. I think it was fairly cheap to make and it made money. I assumed that movie was made by Delta Airlines to to play on the plane. (laughs) (laughs) I have not seen it. I watched it on a flight. Remember flights? Um, Yeah. Mm. It's like, it's fun because it's a con. It's a con game and that's a fun movie to watch, you know? Um, And she's fine in it. Um, No, she's better than fine in it. But, she's playing the Michael King character, right? Yes. She's playing like the suave kind of slickster uh, to Rebel Wilson's like wink, wink, naive rube, you know, who's also in on the con, but like uh, Anne Hathaway is, is the pro uh, in the movie. And she, you know, like kind of like her character in Ocean's 8, like she can pull that kind of suave thing off, 
even though she's so often associated with being like the earnest theater kid. Now I'm just wondering, I'm like, is Delta Airlines going to become our major movie studio? Like, are they going to be one of the few businesses that sees the value in making movies? I mean, they, they, I, the, the airlines are the, 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 the business that's going to keep the mid-budget movie alive <laughs> because right. that's where everyone watches them. But also their business is so fucked now. I could imagine them being like, look, we made like a $50 million romantic comedy. It's playing exclusively on planes. You have to ride a plane to see it. Right. So people are just like flying to Nashville to like. We finally yeah. let Nancy Myers make another movie. It's it's Jennifer Lawrence and fucking Chalamet. And it, you have to book a two hour flight to watch. Yeah, you have to. But don't worry, we've got flights that just take off and circle the airport for uh, for 90 minutes and then land. Hallie Myers Shire bought Wiz Air. So <laughs> it'll be interesting to see now, what happens with she that. She did. She did. <laughs> to wrap up, her yes. other 2019 film was Serenity which I think is, whatever you think of that movie, a film that does not treat her with a lot of respect. No, and uh, it certainly is a movie that the the world clowned on with great glee. <laughs> they did, and it's wild to think that that movie stars two Academy Award-winning actors from that decade. It's not like it stars Oscar winners. It's not like Louise Fletcher's in it, no offense to her. It, those people won Oscars in that decade. Two fresh winners. Two fresh winners. Two people who had won Oscars in the last three years. I will say, though, that like half, like Hathaway Five years, I guess. and Sorry. McConaughey both, as much as that movie is kind of like a cult fascination of how weird and bad it is and what a mess it was, they are lucky that it didn't, it had, like, it. they're lucky it was buried, you know? Because I feel like, I feel like certain people know about that movie, but a lot of people don't. So it wasn't some huge public fiasco for them. But Richard, do you know, I mean, there was that there was that whole thing where it was like Avron Pictures, which has already gone under and seemed right. to be some weird tax scheme. Uh, and then I, I believe, exactly. are you going to say what I think you're going to say, David, what I was about to say? Go ahead. Say what you're going to say. I want to hear you say it. No, I don't think I'm going to say what you're going to say. Say what you're going to say. I believe Hathaway and McConaughey's reps sued Avron Pictures for making their stars look bad by not putting enough promotional support behind the movie. I see. Okay. I believe it's the exact opposite. You're right. That should be their takeaway. We got away clean. We escaped that one from the skin of our teeth. I believe they were like, we were promised this movie was going to be given a golden birth. You've damaged our stars' images by not drawing all of the world's eyes to serenity. But then that's Streisand affecting because I think that most people in America don't know what that movie is. And if you bring attention to it with a lawsuit, it's like <laughs> but the thing people is, didn't know this movie existed. Well, look, I just, I can't discuss ongoing lawsuits that I'm a part of. That's all I want. Of course, that's anyway. fair. David was the head of Avron Pictures before he transitioned to Quibi. <laughs> and, right, right, exactly. Really, if you actually check the files, it's the same company. Yeah, Griffin, have you looked at the at the bank account for this podcast because, for in a while? Because <laughs> oh, it, it might be a little slippery. <laughs> it's slippery. It's uh, slippery. I'm just looking, I'm just confirming it here. McConaughey, Hathaway, Stephen Knight together all sued Avron Pictures. I do believe they genuinely got screwed there. You know, movies quality aside, it was a weird situation where you would email Avron Pictures being like, hey, uh, are there screenings available? And they would be like, uh, uh, no Espanol. Like, you know, like you were just like, wait, hello, aren't you a movie studio? Do you have a press screening? Like, it was I, I, weird. I know it's not Avron, but I, um, the movie After, which actually ended up doing really well. That was Avron. Yes. Oh, that was? That was Avron. Okay, so it was then. So I was assigned by an editor at work to cover that movie. And I was like, you don't have to ask me twice. Harry Styles fanfic becomes a movie? Yes, please. <laughs> I tried to find an email. I couldn't find anything. It ended with me calling the production offices and a receptionist answered, and I was like, hi, I'm from Vanity Fair. I'm trying to um, track down a screening or a screener link of, of After because I have to review it. And she, the, the young woman on the phone was like, um, wh where, where are you from? Oh, okay. Uh, hold on one second. And then there was like a long, like I was on hold for maybe a minute, which is a long time. And then a, a kind of gruff man picked up the phone and was like, why are you calling? <laughs> what, what, why do you want to know about that movie? And I was, and he just like, and like basically hung up the phone. It was like I had called, like the mobs, like you know the Russian mobs, like laundering company, like the, you know, it was like so crazy. And I just, I've never seen that movie because of it. But like a after now has gotten a like 
foreign produced sequel that's hard R rated that did very well overseas, well, right? Because the first after did amazingly well in the UK. Right. Bombed yes. here because of Avron. Yeah. Yeah. The new one's called After We Collided. Right. And it's, it's, it's made a bunch of money uh, overseas. And it is a hard R, right? It's a hard R now. I have no idea. I, I, that's 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 more information that I could give you right now about the after universe. I'm sorry, you you've taxed me. You've, you found you found my weakness. I've got, I know nothing more. But they already greenlit the 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 next two. T- to wrap Anne's career, sure. This year she was in The Witches, which is a bad movie that I give two stars. And Gosh, she was yeah. in D. Reese's The Last Thing He Wanted, oh, which God. is on Netflix now if you want to watch it. Which is a snowman level. Did they forget to finish the movie object? It's not even bad in a boring way. You're just like, I'm not sure I'm seeing an, like, are there scenes missing? Is like, what happened? Did they drop it on Netflix by mistake? Did they not upload the final, you know, there's just something so weird about that thing. Well, the issue with that is I had to read the the novella that it's based on, the Joan Didion the novella, Didion. because we were going to do it as like a book club thing for our podcast. And then the, then the release got pushed and everything. Um, and the book, I mean, much like, you know, Democracy, a lot of her other fiction, like, it's really hard to parse what's happening in the book, let it alone trying to translate that into not only just like a straightforward thriller, but like something a little more artful, which I assume Dee Reese was trying to do. And it's just like, yeah, none of that works. But if you tell people like there was a big budget Netflix adaptation of a Joan Didion work by the writer and director of Mudbound, yeah. starring Anne Hathaway, Ben Affleck, and Willem Dafoe, that came out before the pandemic. Like, it, not part of this soup of just things disappearing into the ether. Got, like, a proper... Played at the Paris Theater. It was at Sundance. Yes, it was. Right. It, like, it got, like, a proper normal before times launch. And, and it's just, like... It has not registered at all because everyone who sees it cannot calculate its existence. But here's my point, if I have one, about Hathaway's sort of post-intern, I guess, career. All of those decisions that I... All those movies, like, they basically make sense. I would not say she's made great choices. Things like The Hustle and Serenity, you know, come on. Ocean's Eleven, that makes more sense. Dark Waters, even The Witches, this big director, right? I, I don't know if I can find fault, though, and be like, this is a train wreck five years. But the, the collective thing, when you look at it, it's like, oh, this is bad. She needs, like, uh, well, the to problem pull out is of this she's, spin. She's wandering perilously close to Naomi Watts syndrome, which is pick the right thing, you know, the, the right people, the right pedigree. It's just, like, the project after the one that worked. Or, you know, it's like the Game of Thrones pilot that doesn't go, you know? And and that is a trap that so many actors can fall into. I was never sure that Naomi Watts had, like, you know, broken some old crone's dream catcher until the Game of Thrones. The Game of Thrones thing. Go. That was the one where it was like, this is rude. The, 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 the Game of Thrones show not going was like, because, you know, everyone she works with was like, Naomi, I know it's been rough with movies. This is a fucking sure bet. Look at the Casper assembling. You're the lead of it. It's HBO. They ne- they They so rarely don't take a pilot to series like... And then, Naomi, they want to do 10 Game of Thrones spinoffs. This is the first yeah. one. There's never been more of a sure thing. And they deliver the pilot and they're like, we'll wait for the next one. I will say she <laughs> had a movie that was at Toronto called Penguin Bloom, which Ooh. is about a magpie, not a penguin. They just name it Penguin. That's actually a nice little movie that Netflix picked up. And I think it'll be good for her. So. I think that movie is going to not exist, Richard. I hate to tell you. No, I don't wow. think it's going to exist, but it's not going to be like yet another like uh oh for her. No, it won't be a stain. Although I, well, I shouldn't say this, but I was emailing with a publicist and I said I think it's really good for her, and I got a very terse response back to that. <laughs> <laughs> I don't. What do you mean? I mean, you know. what do you mean, Naomi? I and I love Naomi Watts. I don't mean to clown on Naomi Watts. It's just we all are in the same boat with her. Where we're like, come on, what's going on? But here? it's a real trap that actors can f- fall into. I think, yes, unfortunately, 100%. it happens a lot more often to female, like you know, female actors at a certain you know, like late thirties, where the projects just get thinner and thinner, and so they have to pick the stuff that seems the best. But like, you're not guaranteed that a Zemeckis movie is going to be good. You're not gar- guaranteed that you know, a Joan Didion D. Reese movie is going to be good. And it's just been a really bad run of bad luck for her. 
I, I'll say who, a couple things about Hathaway. You know, I, what do you say? I, I have a longer thing to unpack about Hathaway. Who now? Give, give me your Hathaway thing, because then I want to pivot to Octavia for a second. Gladly. So Hathaway, I feel like, is a particularly good interview. I think she's very kind of sober when she talks about her place in the industry and her career, uh, especially for someone who's had great had, success. Right. Yeah. She's had great success, but had weird ups and downs and she's not self pitying, you know, but she really sees things, I think, for what they are. And I feel like a couple years ago, she started in a lot of interviews, not in this boo hoo kind of way saying like, I'm very aware of the fact that I'm not the hot young thing anymore, you know, mm -hmm. like that when I started out my career and I was in my early 20s and I was getting roles that were originally written for women in their 30s, that I would get stink eye from these actresses who I was now sniping parts out from. And I'm very aware like that I'm not Jennifer Lawrence, you know, that she's now in that position that I was in and I'm in another point of the bell curve and I need to figure out what my career is now. So she's in that odd position where it's like, Okay, right. So she's not like the spring chicken anymore, but also she's 38 years old. Like she has had so much career for someone who is still incredibly young, right? Yeah. And still looks yeah. very young and plays very young. But I think she's aware of that thing that is not just the ageism in Hollywood, but the sort of like, what have you done for me lately? Who's the shiniest object? Who is that, that excitement over kind of thing? Where then if she still wants to be the lead of a movie, she has to sort of go a little bit sideways to read define what an Anne Hathaway movie is, maybe, you know? Which is why I thought Colossal was such an interesting thing I agree. for her. Because yeah. it was like, yeah. it was with Neon, it was this brand new company, like, and it just didn't pan out. I think the movie deserved better, you know? But yeah. I think if she does a few more things like that, maybe some great glossy miniseries, you know, in the vein of Sharp Objects or something like that, she'll be she'll be right back. Like, it'll be fine. But like... Yeah. Right. The D. Reeves thing makes perfect paper in that oh, way. Yeah. Make, makes perfect sense on paper, I should say. It doesn't make perfect paper. It actually makes really bad paper. Yeah, um, don't try and write on um, the last thing she wanted. It's not going to... No. No, it's like writing on duct tape. Um, but uh, I, I, you see the appeal of something like The Witches, where it's sort of like, well, this is a role that is age agnostic. This sets me up for a different type of career yeah. in a certain way. I could enter a different era. I can enter an era of more theatricality, more sort of character -y performances, where maybe I can still be the the star, the above the title person, but I don't have to be the protagonist anymore in that sort of way. Her big movie that she's supposed to do is the Sesame Street movie, which Jonathan Kressel wrote and is directing, who did Moonbase 8 and Baskets and Portlandia, is like one of the best uh, comedy directors in television and has not made a feature yet. Um, and they twice have been two months away from starting production. The first time it got pulled because she got pregnant again, and the second time it got pulled because the pandemic happened. And that very much feels like her trying to do a, like, she's the main human character, she's the human who's with all the Muppets trying to help them get back to Sesame Street the entire movie, and she'll get to sing and dance and be funny. And she's filming a movie during, pan the pan like, about the pandemic, right? She's doing. Like, she's in lockdown, the uh, right. Stephen Knight movie, which we just talked about on another episode, Griffin. And now we've I can't been, remember which we've, one it I was. believe joked about it maybe on three consecutive episodes. Are now. you sure you guys didn't talk about that in a production meeting for with Stephen Knight? Well, David is in the movie. Right, we should mention right. that David is in the film lockdown. <laughs> I'm the I'm the thing they're stealing. She's also in the James Gray movie. She's in the James Gray coming right. of age Bronx in the 60s, uh, Queens in the 60s movie, which is Sutherland, Oscar Isaac, Hathaway, Robert De Niro, Kate Blanchett, which is pretty stacked. There's no way that thing's a nothing. Hathaway and Gray are a good fit. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, it's, it's going to be interesting, but I think she's trying to figure out she was never really an ingenue, but I think she's trying to find a space for herself as an actress that is not tied to this sort of value of shininess, you know, in this in this stupid industry. I hope she gets, yeah, right. I hope she does some cool stuff soon. Now, Octavia Spencer, who won an yeah. Academy Award in 2012, 2011 for the help, you know. And has now been nominated three times or four times? Three-time nominee. Yeah. Uh, and I would say is an incredibly reliable actress. Yeah. Like, you know, like... I, doesn't miss. And has a really high, like, Q score, I would think. Yeah. Has a high... Right. Is is well-liked. Ma is like a meme. Like... Ma... Ma fucking... 
Ma's great. I just think she has so much goodwill and she's she's actually the Eugene Levy example of like, when is she bad? Like, when have you ever seen her be bad? Even if she's been cast in some phoned in role or what, you know, like she's not really being right. given much to do. Right. She's solid. She's worked with like Bong Joon-ho, Guillermo del Toro, right? Like, you know, uh, uh, Zemeckis now, like she's worked with interesting directors. Kugler, obviously, in um, Fruitvale Station. You know, Diablo, she was in that Diablo Cody movie. And it's, uh, has done comedy, drama, horror, has done everything. Animated movies. Right. Yeah. Just It's just sort of like, it, a lot of these movies are, what, you know, are not movies that I love. Like, so, I, you know, I, she's in a few divergence, apparently. That's one of those series is that people were in. I think Naomi Watts is in one of those. Yeah, well, she Naomi Watts yeah. is in one of them, and Kate Winslet kills her. Or Naomi Watts kills Kate Winslet, I forget. Who knows? Who can say? And that's the franchise that was never finished, right? They just never made yes. the final movie? It was going to go on it was going to go on to Amazon and then they just said actually you know what we're not going to make it at all. Because <laughs> <Right. laughs> the idea of legitimate movie stars having to do something that goes straight to a streaming platform was the world's greatest insult 4 years ago to Shailene Woodley. <laughs> like it was not even like <laughs> yes. Right, and Ansel Elgort. Yeah. Who? And like I did not mm, exactly who indeed. Uh I did not like Loose. Um I the, did. Uh, truly I own a film, but some people liked it. I think she's pretty interesting in that. Ma is a movie that is just made to be a meme, made to be kind of like a fun, <laughs> trashy horror movie. They should make another Ma, I think. Um, uh, but, uh, you know, I, I liked Ma. Have you seen Ma, Griff? Yeah, yeah, I've seen Ma. Ma is real good. Ma's fun. I, yeah. I, I saw Ma with some friends um, back when you could go to like friends' houses and stuff. And, um, we went then went to a bar, which is like a kind of a room in public where you would, you know, drink and stuff. Um, and I, I something my something in my brain like just really shut down, and I couldn't stop making ma puns for well, well, well past <laughs> where it was funny at all. And people were gen genuinely getting annoyed at me, but I couldn't. Anytime there was an "uh" sound in a sentence I was saying, I would have to replace it with "ma." It was that movie is potent. <laughs> That's what I'll say. Yeah, absolutely. Isn't that thing Ava, the latest Tate Taylor movie? Um, right. With Jessica Chastain and Colin Farrell and fuck. That's like just on Netflix. Yeah. Well, yeah. Because it, it was on Redbox or something. It was on Direct TV. Or Direct TV. Direct TV. Right. And now it's on Netflix and it's like doing well. And I hovered over it the other day, you know, like when I showed like a little autoplay, a preview a scene of the movie. And it was just Gina Davis in a wheelchair talking to Jessica Chastain about her hair. And I was Sounds like, isn't good. this an action movie? <laughs> it was a very <laughs> strange choice. I scene. just, I'm just, Tate Taylor's career. I don't, I genuinely like two of the movies he made and I really can't stand one of them. And the one that I can't stand is the one that was nominated for Best Picture. But like, I think Get On Up is pretty great. Yeah. I think Ma is a lot of fun. I never saw the girl on the train. I assume that is bad. Like that was always my. Uh... It's bad, except that like the, um, there are good performances in it. But the guy works right. He'll get a good performance out of someone, and he's got a sort of trashy feel that is now feeling like it's like, oh, this is like his thing, not just sort of what he stumbles right. into. The trashiness is what I like. I, I wish right. he'd go yeah. whole hog into that. Octavia's just got such an interesting career because it's like she was a a casting associate, right? She She's was like three, the reader. Three Tate Taylor movies. I'm sorry, four Tate Taylor movies, just to be clear. That's why I was I, I believe they did the groundlings together. Am I mistaken about They're that? Old, old friends. They're yeah. old because right. she's in his movie that no one's ever heard of. It's called like Chicken Party or whatever. You know, she's like in that thing. We should also mention that Octavia Spencer produced Green Book. She did. Y yes. Yes. So she she's did. been working a lot. Yeah. Yeah. No, but my, my point here was Octavia Spencer started out, I believe, as either a casting associate or a reader or both. But she worked in casting for a long time and was one of those people where, like, they would occasionally give her a small part, right? Because they were like, she's really good. You should give her, like, an under five. 
just to be clear, uh, Kate Winslet is the reader. But yes, no, everything else you're saying is true. <laughs> Thank you for the clarification. Um, but yeah, no, and she, you know, she's way back. If you watch like Being John Malkovich, she has one scene in that. You know, she uh, b- before she started getting bigger roles, I knew her as just one of those people where you're you like, knew oh, her I face. know that person. Yeah, she's, yeah. She, that's a fun one scene character actor presence. But like, isn't she right. in like Dinner for Schmucks or something? Absolutely. Her yeah. first credit is 1996, A Time to Kill, Rourke's North nurse, right? She's the woman in the elevator in Malkovich. She's in, like, Big Mama's Spider-Man. house. You know, she's in Spider-Man. Right, right. Big Big Santa Win a date with Ted Hamilton. Like, she's just in all these fucking movies. And then, excuse me, when she got um, the help, I think it was very much seen as one of those, like, here's someone who's just been, like, doing the work for years. It, it never was a given that she was ever going to get a part this good. She stepped up to the plate. This movie's dog shit. It's a shit pie. But, like, I'm all in favor of giving her the Oscar because when is she going to get another chance like this? And then, surprisingly, like, in, in a positive turn in this bullshit world, she's gotten two other Oscar nominations and has not only kept a robust career working on, like, really interesting projects with different directors, but has also, like, kind of willed herself into becoming a movie star. Like, I thought she was just going to be, at best, a sort of, like, high-level character actress. Like, that's a big and Octavia Spencer or whatever. But she's kind of done it all now. She's done her own fucking TV show. She's starred in things. She's played support in things. As you said, she's done voiceover. She like, ran afoul just... of Angela Lansbury, which is a huge career landmark for any actor. Wait, did she? <laughs> well, because she was going to star in a remake of Murder, She Wrote. Oh, she was? That sounds yeah, good. Yeah. Like a yeah, couple great years idea. after the help. That was going to be her huge TV thing. And then Angela Lansbury like, issued... So did some interview and was like, I don't understand. This sounds bad or something. And and then the show didn't the show didn't happen not because of Angela Lansbury, but yeah, it they coincided. But that's something. If Octavia wants to come back to that fifteen years from now, I'm game. Like that project only gets better the older she gets. Exactly. It can. Yes, wait. that's true. Well, I mean, according to the witches, she's ninety years old. So I guess we, that's you true. Know, the witches has decreed her. <laughs> what I like about that the narrative you just laid out, Griffin, about like the you know this kind of not fluke because she's good in the movie, but like come out of nowhere Oscar win and then the subsequent two nominations to prove that it wasn't at all a fluke is it's kind of a, it's a condensed version of the Marissa Tomei narrative where sure. it's like Marissa yes. Tomei got two other Oscar nominations after her deserved win, but p- she's right. still kind of staying with people this, saw like, oh, as well, a surprise yeah. win. Right, yes, yeah. Right, whereas Octavia is fully seen as like, oh, one of our great actors, a yeah. movie like, star. In the span of, you know, six years, yeah. Right, right. Because even you look like her her run in between help and hidden figures is not as strong as her run from hidden figures to now. You know, where even just like she does Red Band Society, which gets canceled on Fox. Like she, after winning an Oscar, just does a Fox show that doesn't really connect. I think her Apple TV show did okay, too. Yeah, and we're also, we're we're not even talking about her single biggest accomplishment. What? Which is? David. What? She's dab dab the duck in too little. I know. She is. She sure is. Dab dab the she duck. She sure is. Film I've seen. That's the film I've seen twice. But do you know how that happened, Griffin? She how went did that to happen? the studio and presented her chilling vision in chilling detail. <laughs> <laughs> she opened the book of Dab Dab. Um Dab Dab from the book I, of Salt. I think I think we just also have to acknowledge that Angela Lansbury played Balloon Lady in Mary Poppins Returns. That's a thing that happened. It was committed to film. <laughs> but does she know she did? <laughs> I don't or was know. She, no, no. Was she just sitting in a park with balloon. You know, that's also that that part was designed for Julie Andrews. Julie Andrews, She right. was like is, hard pass. I believe younger, like 10 yes. years younger than Angela Lansbury. Absolutely. <laughs> Angela Lansbury is 95 years old. Right, right. And it's like the, Angela Lansbury, it's like the connection there is like, okay, she was the star of Bed Knobs and Broomsticks, which is the movie that everyone confuses with Mary Poppins. <laughs> yeah. I just right. like that they were like, Okay, there's this clear chain of succession where we can have Dick Van Dyke come back and play the son of the banker from the last movie. That works, and no one else is playing Bert. But we've replaced Mary Poppins, so we should give her some role to pay tribute. Julie Andrews sees it, and she's like, this would be rude. Let Emily Blunt do her thing. I don't need to be in this movie. And they were like, okay, so, I don't know, some other legendary broad? (laughs) 
<laughs> Who's some other like classy bag of bones we can put in this movie for one scene? Hand Ben Winshaw balloon. It was going to be Sean Connery. <laughs> balloon? I love the balloons. <laughs> There's that 15 years of roles in movies where you're like, what is this part? And they're like, they were really trying to coax Connery out of retirement. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> this exists in the movie because they thought they were going to get to him in the last second. He said, I'd rather golf. <laughs> David. Yep. Brooklyn. Mm-hmm. Brooklyn. What? Brooke Clinton? Linen. David Brooke Clinton. David. Brooklyn. Yeah. You're calling in to talk Brooklyn? I'm calling in. It's me. I'm the co host of the show. What are you talking about? I've been here the whole time. Oh, that's right. Well, I'm sorry. I'm a little out of it because some mornings I wake up and I just want to pull the covers back over my head and go back to sleep. Mm. Part of the reason. I have Brooklyn and Sheets. I mean, you know, they, they got me covered. They're really nice. I'm going to reserve my judgment. I can't really relate. That's never a thing that happens to me. But yes, you know, I, you, you're reminding me that I do, in fact, love my Sheets because of Brooklyn. And yeah, and you like them because, you know, it's Rich and Vicky's company that finds beautiful home essentials that doesn't cost an arm and a leg. Yes, yes. It's a direct-to-consumer bedding company. So you got like luxury materials available without luxury-level markups. I mean, that's what we're talking about. Yeah, I mean, I also just love Rich and Vicky. They're probably my... my they seem very cool. My closest friends who I have never met or spoken to. But I really feel that level of intimacy with them. Don't you? I do talk about... Yeah, I know. I talk about Rich and Vicky a lot. And I'm like, yeah, one day maybe I'll meet him and I'll be like, you know how much I've talked about you on the, on the podcast? You mention it to Forky every night before you fall asleep. You go, oh, thank God, Rich and Vicky. You know, I just Google them and they're just, they just look like a lot of fun. I want to hang out with them. I know. That's, that's like the real, like, you know, when the pandemic is over, what can we look forward to? Let's stalk Rich and Vicky full up until they become okay, our friends. Okay, well, wait a second. What? We just want them to be our friends. I yes, want to repay exactly. the favor. They give me such good sheets. They do. And look, it's 2021. You can do something nice for yourself to start the new year. To help you do that, Brooklyn has a special offer. If you go to brooklinen.com and use promo code CHECK, you'll get $25 off when you spend $100 or more, plus free shipping. That's B-R-O-O-K-L-I-N-E-N.com and enter promo code CHECK. $25 off when you spend $100 or more, plus free shipping. Brooklinen.com. Use promo code CHECK at checkout. It's 2021. Treat yourself well. Brooklyn.com. Promo code check. We love to hear it. Can't wait to meet them. All right. Um, do we have any more thoughts on the witches? Because I want to play the box office game. And yes, we will be playing the box office game. That's right. I don't know how you're going to do this. I will say uh, this, I think, is uh, it can now go down in history as the least we've ever talked about a movie on this show. I mean, what am I supposed to say? I like the costume design. But but it's like <laughs> right. I said at the top of the, of the show, three things happen in this story. Like, yeah. there's not a lot to really go through. I don't know. He moves the camera around a bit. I hated the uh, mouse I, okay. shit. Yeah, here's what I'll say. I think the mouse shit sucks. I can't figure out what's wrong with it. Aside from, as you said, it's too antiky. But also, I think they have the wrong approach to animating the mice. There's a yeah, weird, the mice are all like, wrong. Yeah, the whole vibe of them is wrong. Their performances are just like, they move like little people, but it's also not mo -capped. It's clearly like keyframed animated and they're really cartoony. They're out of a different movie. They look worse than Stuart Little. Um, it's very odd, especially because I feel like so much of the eeriness of the witches when you read the book and you would see the images in your brain, but also watching the Rogue movie, is that it's like, oh, that looks like a real mouse and a kid's voice is coming out of it. There's that exit existential like Kafka-esque terror of there's a kid trapped in the mouse's body that is somehow taken away when the mouse is just like walking around on two <laughs> feet and going like, hey, how you doing, lady? Yeah. Like this very expressive bipedal mouse, you know? There's, there's also the problem of Kristen Chenoweth sounds like a kid for an adult. She's, she doesn't actually sound like a child. <laughs> yes, this is true. And yet she's acting as a child against two actual children. And it just, like, it makes no sense whatsoever. But I'd heard everyone shit on this movie, and I will say the first whatever it was, 30 minutes until they get turned into mice, I was like, I'm surprised by how much I'm liking this. I thought there was genuine feeling to the stuff with Octavia Spencer and, and yeah. the well, grandson. The, the, the scene where she dances and oh, so good. tries to get him to cheer up, and that whole sequence yeah. is wonderful. That All that stuff is great. Right, and that's a lot of that's Octavia. But, but it feels like there's some feeling and specificity there to that. And I actually like the first grand meeting scene. Like, until the witch 
it's fine. Turns him into a fucking mouse. I like it. Yeah. And here's the thing I'll say I like about it because I think this is going to be a slightly controversial opinion before we stop talking about this movie and never talk about it ever again in the history of this podcast. I do like he's not pushing any boundaries here technologically, but I do like that in its best moments, I do think he is using CGI in a way that I prefer, which is he is just trying to create nightmare imagery, right? Like there's shit like the weird growing of the witch arms that I kind of like because it feels aggressively disturbing and completely unconcerned with realism. And it feels like a modern evocation of, I feel like a lot of the children's movies that our generation talk about that kind of scarred us, where you're just like that weird thing, that scene upset me, like shit like the Rogue the Witches or Lost in Oz or whatever, you know? Oh, well, that's really what I like premised my review on when I when I wrote the review of the Witches is like this kind of like belabored intro about like, Maybe it's just my age, but it just feels like when I was a kid, like movies were genuinely scary and for yeah. they were made for children, like Return to Oz, like The Witches. And what I appreciated to some mild extent in this is that, like, it, that scene with the arms, if I were seven years old, eight years old, nine years old watching that, I would actually be scared. And right. So it's, good. it's, it's a faint praise award, but as opposed to a lot of these movies, which seem to be sanitized from top to bottom, there are moments where I feel like this film actually succeeds in achieving a kind of Roald Dahl scariness. Um, None of the... I mean, Nicholas Rogue directs that movie, that like a horror movie. It looks like Tysteria. Right. But like... Yeah, it rules. But this, I, you know, I think that they're losing a bit of like the the particular shabby kind of whimsy of Roald Dahl. Um, I agree. But, but yeah, I think that like where it counts in terms of little kids seeing the movie and and actually having some sort of... I mean, I think it's good that, s- that scary things should imprint on kids if they're actually, you know, if, if they're harmless, you know? That's the thing I like about it. I like that it's a little bit scary. The mice suck. That's my review. I guess I give it... What did you give it, David? Uh, two out of five, you know. Okay, so I'm trying to think if I give it a, a nut or a butt. I'm trying to think which, which <laughs> I would give it. I guess I give it... I give it half a cheek. Yeah, half a cheek. All right, there you go. Somewhere between half a cheek and a pecan. Let's play the box office game. We're going to do the box office week that this movie came out and was always supposed to come out, October 23rd, 2020. Can you tell me what the number one movie at the box office was that week, Griffin? It was a film with a major movie star. Can I just point out? Mm Mm-hmm. The biggest thing I think we've lost uh, this year is the box office, right? And and, and, The box uh, office game, yes. But but uh, but also, it's just kind of never going to come back in the same way. Like, I think this is the Maybe, opportunity yeah. the studios have always been looking for to start hiding their finances a little bit and only having to report things during investor days. And I think uh, you're going to see a lot, especially with movies that are being released, you know, day and date. There's, there's going to be a lot less transparency with this stuff. It's going to be a lot harder for us to play this game. Uh, let's keep on talking about the past. Okay, so give me, it's October... 23rd, 2020. Um, is Hocus Pocus the number one movie at the box office? Hocus Pocus is number six at the mm. box office. Thank you for bringing it up, though. Um, but it is doing very well in its 1424th week, uh, making a robust 530,000. But no, number one, it was number one last week. It's holding very well this week to $2.3 million. That's right. God. Number one at the box office. It's an action movie. Action is thriller. Is it uh, Honest Thief? Honest thief, never steal a man's second chance. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Liam Neeson is the honest thief. What if there was an honest thief? Okay. Does it just feel weird to to like talk about a movie like this and have none of us gone to see it in theaters? I mean, to be fair, I'm not sure any of us would have seen Honest Thief. Maybe. I would have seen Honest Thief in theaters. Even by my fandom of crappy Liam Neeson movies, I would have been there opening <laughs> night. I would have brought my codger. <laughs> Oh, God. No, no, thank you. Uh, Liam Neeson, uh, he plays the In and Out Bandit in that movie. That's his nickname. The In and Out Bandit? Yeah, I don't think he robs In and Outs. I think he's just In and Out quickly. But No, he steals people's copies of uh, In and Out on DVD. <laughs> no, the real In and Out Bandit, bandit is Joan Cusack because she stole that movie. She steals that movie, <laughs> Richard! Next year, he's in a movie called The Marksman. Liam Neeson is going to make these things until he is forcibly arrested and put in prison. What if he's the last theatrical movie star? That's fine, I guess. Whatever. Number two, 
at the box okay. office. It's been out for three weeks. It's made $9 million. War with Grandpa? It's the War with Grandpa. I mean, it's still in pickings here, David. I, I'm, I'm trying to remember here. I mean, I still do check the box office every week. I feel like it's not sinking in, but clearly it is. Hocus Pocus, I feel like, peaked earlier, right? Like, Because there was the week where suddenly Hocus Pocus outgrossed Tenet. But I think that was earlier in October. It was the week where, I, I'm not sure it ever quite outgrossed Tenet, but there was a week, no, but it was close. In On uh, October 9th, it was within, October 2nd and October 9th, it was within a million dollars of Tenet both times. Um, but it never quite caught it. But uh, the war with Grandpa, though. So, you know, obviously, you know, salute the veterans yeah. of the war with Grandpa. Uh, Oaks Fegley, we stand. I don't know. I mean, that movie was shot, I think, 2016. I mean, it was shot pre-Weinstein Me Too. Yeah, it, it was, was produced shot by Weinstein. In, in the Obama administration. <laughs> right. It is It is truly incredible to look at the poster for War with Grandpa and then look up a photo of what Oaks Figley looks like today. I uh, There was a, a Twitter meme going around or like a prompt like this week or last week about like uh, your, a, your one of your favorite movies – in just four, four stills and not, you know, no text or whatever. Yes, yes. Yeah. And I was like, boop, 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 Google image search war with grandpa. And um, <laughs> I found two stills from the movie from different scenes where it's just Robert De Niro looking, you know, kindly down at Oaks Fegley with his hand on his shoulder. Different yeah. sweaters, different points in the movie. Yeah. I just, I, I really, you know, you can tell what that movie's about from those cells. It, it sounds like it's about the love with Grandpa. Yeah. Yeah, seriously. That movie also has eight names above the title. Uma Thurman, Rob Riggle, Harvey Keitel, Christopher Walken. Angela Lansbury. <laughs> Balloon Lady. <laughs> um, Cheech Marin. Cheech Marin, yeah. De Niro, Thurman, Riggle, Fegley, Mar Nora Morano. With Cheech Marin, wait, I have to get this right. With Cheech Marin, with Jane Seymour, and Christopher Walken. Wow. Is Kaitel not in it? I'm trying to remember if he bowed out or if I just added him in my mind. Uh Kaitel is not in it as far as I wow. know. <laughs> I don't you're know. in a you're in a war with Harvey Kaitel, but it's not has nothing to do with that. I'm in a I'm in a war with Kaitel. I should also just mention I should we should pay some respect uh, as you listed the cast there. Uh, Laura Morano uh, of The War with Grandpa. Of course, we know her best for being in the Back to You sitcom. And if you want to see Laura Morano on the Back to You sitcom, you got to watch that Back to You season one DVD box set. God, I feel dirty. You know, he he signed that loss, the Texas lawsuit against the election. I'm saying Dan Crenshaw lights camera Jackson. He signed it. Lights camera Jackson. And the weird thing is, he does have standing. Unlike yeah, the Supreme Court will hear his argument. <laughs> yeah. Uh, number four at the box office is the not the most successful film released post pandemic. Tenant. Tenant, which made. Uh, fifty-seven million dollars domestically, and it's still in theaters. So I guess it can yeah. keep adding to that total. And and you you have to wonder when a movie will next surpass that number. Yes, and three hundred and sixty million dollars worldwide. Tenet. We talked about it recently. Number five at the box office is a a Halloween classic. Hmm. That was re-released. It's not Hocus Pocus. No. Is it a horror movie or is it like a family Halloween movie? It's a family film. Is it Nightmare? Yes, Nightmare Before Christmas, which I guess comes out every year, right? Well, they were doing the 3D re-releases every year, and then I feel like they stopped them, and then I, I think they, they've they been doing robust business this year. Because it also, they I mean, the Disney just fucking cracked the code on that movie, which is just like, we make money from Halloween to Christmas. That movie just runs the table for the last three months of the year. I'm sorry, I'm forgot I'm realizing I forgot to ask you what the number three movie. It's the only new film uh at the box office this week. It's making one million dollars. It's number three. Uh, there's a reason I forgot it. If if you if you consider its title, this is one of those movies, it's a horror film, uh, that was like literally released under cover of darkness. Hillbilly elegy? <laughs> <laughs> if only. So wait, um, wait a second, wait a second, wait a second. I'm sorry. Honest Thief is number one. Yeah. War with Grandpa is number two. Yes. You're saying Tenant is number four. 
and it's Nightmare four. is number five. Okay. Yes, that's I skipped I over confused. this entry. Okay. I, I, irresponsible. The score is now uh, 27 Griffin 2, David. Um, okay. It's it's not the it's not the Amblin one, right? It's not Come Play or whatever that's called, the G- Gilly <laughs> Jacobs one. <laughs> the most insane title ever given. To did me. you listen to Comedy Bang Bang where he kept calling it Come Play? <laughs> <laughs> yes, I did. Yes, I did. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Just kept yeah. saying Come Play. Uh, that's that's a fun realization saying that movie out loud for the first time. Yep, but that's yep, like yep. that's another movie where you're like, I don't know. I guess that made eleven million dollars. I guess that's the fifth highest grossing film of twenty twenty. Yeah, it's sticking around. I guess you're right. Did Unhinged um, do well? Unhinged did, I think, about as well as it would have done, not in a pandemic. It made twenty million dollars. That's huge for a documentary. <laughs> <laughs> Richard. <laughs> God, that movie that movie oh, it, oh I, uh, I have some things to say about that movie have you seen it mm-hmm. wow yeah i saw it i had to write about it so did i yep uh no come on griffin it stars an actor we both like we were talking about him with hmm. nia da costa hmm. james badge dale james badge dale it was, it was another one it was filmed in 2017 and it was a Fox movie that just sat while the Disney merger oh, sort of oh, went on. Right. Uh, it's called The Something Man, right? The Empty Man. Yeah. And it was one of those things where even by the standards of a pandemic release, it got dumped. This is what <laughs> like, I'm talking about, though, Richard. It's like that's where they fucking hide the movies now in theaters. Stre- streaming, right. all eyes on streaming. That's where yeah. you put your big money propositions. <sighs> anyway, that's it. That's our that's our episode. This is the NSMACUS. Oh, but we have to do our rankings. Oh boy, Jesus! I totally forgot about that. Let me see if I have my up to date rankings here. Um, I'm gonna stall for a moment. It's not like that's but... ever happened on the end of an episode, uh, end of a miniseries before. <laughs> I think I. Do you have this? But I might shift a couple things. So why don't you I'll read do mine your list first, first. Uh, Richard? Okay. I assume you want to do yours now. Um. Yeah. My ranking. It's actually just an acrostic that spells out Beowulf. Is that <laughs> <laughs> what, Richard? What is your favorite Zemeckis movie? I guess that's an easier question. Well, I mean, I um, our 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 friend Jamie was talking about my favorite contact on this podcast. Um. Yes. I put Castaway on the BBC poll of best of the, of the decade. Um, or best wow. of the 21st century so far or something. I love, love, love Castaway. I know it's a polarizing movie. Um, but I think it's con- Contact and Castaway that were the two... Because I liked Forrest Gump. You know, I was like 11 when it came out or whatever. I, I saw Back to the Future. I liked those. Fine. Um, but but uh, Contact and Castaway just felt like grown-up cinema that I was like finally as a teenager ready to like claim as my own, you know? And so I've always been, like, excited about a Zemeckis movie, even though he has let us down, as I'm, you guys have extensively covered, <laughs> some uh, less yes. than fruitful, uh, you know, avenues uh, in recent years. Okay, I have my list. It's 20 in total? 20. I just, I I did my rearranging while Richard was talking, and I want to say it now, because if I let you go, read it first, go, I'm going to change go, my no, list go. eight more times. Okay, ready? Number one, Back to the Future. Yes, sure. Number two, yes, sure. Who Framed the Roger Rabbit. Number three, Castaway. Nice. Number four, David and Richard, Don't At Me, Back to the Future Part Two. Mm, sure, sure. Hmm. What Robert Zemeckis calls perhaps the weirdest film I will ever make in my entire career. It's a weird one. But that's about the the human Back to the Future 2, not the toy. The real Back to the Future 2. Right. Number five, I want to hold your hand. Number six, Allied. What? <laughs> six. <laughs> Good God, that's ridiculous. All right, keep it going. Keep it going. Griffin just became Matthew Morrison as the Grinch. Like, not his background. <laughs> David, you don't want to know how high it was originally. I only changed it recently. That's ridiculous. Okay. Number seven, Contact. You have it over Contact. All right, keep going. I mean, I could maybe flip those two. You do what you want. Number eight, Death Becomes Her. Yep. Number nine, Back to the Future, Part Three. Mm-hmm. Number ten, Romancing the Stone. Yep. 
Number 11, used cars. Yep. A fun comedy with bad gender politics. Sure. 12, Beowulf. Okay. I'm sorry. Let me take that again. 12. Beowulf! <laughs> That's all right. All right. Okay, sorry. <laughs> sorry, I didn't I didn't give that the right energy. Okay, the first keep time. going, keep going. Number 13, what lies beneath? Yes. Number 14. I'm gonna roll it. Flight. Yeah, feeling all right. Number 15, four scump. Yeah. We both have it low. Number 16, the witches. Wow. Okay. Four scump just barely edging out a movie that I will never think about ever again for the rest of my life. Uh Uh-huh. And then this is where I go into, like, what do I value more or less in movies I don't like, right? Like, which qualities irritate me more versus which qualities do I have to respect begrudgingly more? So these four, the ranking is tough, but this is what I came up with. Number 17, The Walk. Ultimately, The Walk itself puts it above the other three. I think the walk itself is just such a good sequence, even if the rest of that movie is annoying. Number 18, Welcome to Marwin. Was very confident that was going to be dead last for me. You fuckers knocked it up two positions on my list. And then number 19, Polar Express. And number 20, just through sheer, I have almost never seen a less engaging film with nothing of interest going on A Christmas Carol. All right. Here's, I mean, well, there's some divergence, but I, you know, we, lot going. All right. Okay. Number one for me, Roger Rabbit, as I think I've talked about, which I've never seen. You'd like it. It's a good movie. I was not allowed to see it. It was, my mom had very selective rules, and that was one for what Well, because her brother was killed by a tune, right? Well, no, but that was in Cool World. Okay. So I don't know what the, what the <laughs> Roger Rabbit issue was, but. You'd like it. Number one, Rabbit. Number two, Back to the Future. Mm -hmm. Number three, Contact. Yeah. Number four, Cast Away. Yeah. Number five, I Want to Hold Your Hand. That's my five. Number six, Death Becomes Her. Number seven, Back to the Future Part Three. Number eight, Used Cars. Number nine, Back to the Future Part Two. Number 10, Romancing the Stone. Part two higher than I thought you'd put it. I'm, I'm, I'm pleased. I have a real uh, old and new divide with him, though. It's undeniable. Uh, But I guess it's not so crazy. Number 11, Flight. Mm -hmm. Feeling all right. Number 12, Allied. Number 13, What Lies Beneath. Those two are pretty close for me. Like flawed, interesting, star-driven. I don't know. You know, that that one's very flippable. 14, I am Beowulf. Mm -hmm. Uh, 15, Welcome to Marwin. 16, Gump. That might be trolly of me. I might have to think about that. But, but I mean, I like it. <laughs> 17, The Walk. 18, The Polar Express. I've got the witches down at 19. There's nothing for me there. I, and I tw- can't Christmas believe... Carol is your obvious basement dweller. Right. I thought, I thought because you and I were debating like a week or two ago about whether to put Polar Express or Christmas Carol in last position. And the fact right. for me is like yes. Polar Express is aggressively bad, but that makes it yes. intriguing. It's interesting. It's interesting. It, I, I, it, it gets to 18 by being by sheer force of mania. Christmas Carol just sucks. <laughs> Fuck that movie. If if Mars Needs Moms had counted, where would that have ranked? One, obviously. Yeah, we're gonna and contact could have been called Earth Needs Dads. Y- yes, <laughs> <laughs> Richard. Richard, we're not topping that. That's the end of Zemeckis. Twenty weeks with some interludes. Can I just say, because you know, trying to you know with distance now figure out ultimately who is Robert Zemeckis, right? Who is he as a filmmaker? Not, I'm not pretending this is as much of a serial parody as it used to be, but to some degree, that's always a thing we're trying to answer on this show when we spend this much, this much time covering one filmmaker, right? And I feel like a lot of what we've discussed, you know, not just the, the man, uh, the siren song of uh, technology luring him away from some of his best story instincts, but also this question of how much of Zemeckis' work is satirical, right? How much of it should you take at face value? What is his intent? Especially someone who started out as a sort of comedic anarchist. Uh, 
And I, I think there's a moment in uh, The Witches, ironically, despite it not being a very good film, that does kind of show what a sort of sly filmmaker he is and how he's able to use the different elements of filmmaking as a medium uh, in order to convey a really complex message. And so I just want to spotlight this before we finish our Robert Zemeckis miniseries. There is a point in The Witches in which Octavia Spencer says, we are family, and then it cuts to her dropping the needle on a record player, and then we are family plays. Mm. Be good to yourselves and each other. <laughs> Have you guys been doing this for five months? Uh, wow. Yeah. Is that, that's not your longest, though. Was Burton longer? Burton's 21 or 22. It's right at the same period as Burton. You know, Burton and him are yeah. know, similar chunks. And were you going oh, to announce Richard, new seasons? Oh, my was, God. Did I miss here at Q? <sighs> Thank I'm you segueing so for you. much. Folks, now that I've made my final... Zemeckis does a bad needle drop in the most on-the-nose way possible joke. It is time to announce our next two miniseries. That's right. That's right. We're announcing two miniseries at once because one of the miniseries is about as easy to watch as anything we've ever covered, and one of them is a little bit tricky. So we want to announce them both in one go. Our next miniseries, much discussed. We, we, I think we kind of just, uh, you know, Tess drove the idea by talking about it in a bunch of episodes and then lately have been teasing it. But we're doing John Musker, Ron Clements. Or did I mix their names up? Is it Ron Clements and John Musker? It's John Musker and Ron Clements. You had it right. Okay. We're doing Musker and Clements. Good job. Legendary, modern, Disney, animation, directors. This miniseries allows us to cover the Disney Renaissance. So we're talking Great Mouse Detective, Little Mermaid. We're talking Aladdin. We're talking Hercules. We're talking Treasure Planet, Princess and the Frog. Bet we are. Moana. All of those movies streaming now on Disney Plus, the only entertainment company that will exist probably in five years. And after that, because that miniseries is going to take us until, I don't know, David, I guess right about the end of March, right? It feels like that. End of March. Yes, uh, we will. We will also have the blankies there uh, to, oh, to sure. you know, as a palate cleanser right sure. at the end of March. We'll have the blankies there, but we're we're saving a Ben's choice for later in the summer, so there won't be a Ben's choice between uh, now and starting Musker Clements, and there won't be a Ben's choice after because uh, well, things lined up pretty nicely. So why not make April May this year, David? <laughs> Well, whatever do you mean, Griffin? Is May. That's really good. Four weeks of April, four Elaine May movies. A New Leaf, Heartbreak Kid, Mikey and Nikki, Ishtar. Easy to see. If you wanted to make it a five week thing, you could. Fi I could find video of the Elaine May play I was in in high school. You were in an Elaine May play in high school? It's called Adaptation. It's like loaded with 70s references like Khalil Gibran and stuff like that. And we as high schoolers in 2000 did it, not understanding a single joke. But we, we went to semifinals in the Massachusetts uh, High School Drama Guild. So One at comedy, cast size, four people. Well, we had a cast of about 18. <laughs> I, I mean, that sounds like some good Patreon content to me. Just saying. Yes. Uh, we're doing Elaine May, the the so far form film career. Supposedly, she might make a fifth. Maybe. Who knows? She's not a young woman, but hopefully. Yeah. Um, a, a true original. She's been on uh, the bracket a few times. She made an absolutely huge blank check movie in Ishtar that was a you know legendary bounce and rolls uh she shot a million fucking feet of film on the night mikey and nikki you know like she right, she hit it in her home she's one of a kind she's the one of one right uh she rules and we're gonna cover her and i'm excited so yeah musker clements elaine may that's what you need to know a uh, heartbreak kid in particular very hard to see so you might want to start trying to track that one down now yes heartbreak kid impossible to see. impossible to see weirdly it's a Fox movie. I, I found out. No, I found out why. And we'll talk about it when we get to that episode. Whatever. Fair enough. Months from now. Um, Richard, thank you so much for being on the show. Always a pleasure. Yeah. Thanks for having me. Uh, your alien Patreon as a plug to subscribe to the Patreon. I've been really enjoying your alien series. Um, and it caused me late at night to 
rent Alien Covenant, which was a mistake because I had very bad dreams. Yeah, not a good late night movie, but a good movie. And Richard, if you love those, then you will probably enjoy the logical next step for our Patreon, our uh, series of commentaries on the Crocodile Dundee movies currently happening over at patreon.com slash blank check. That is real. That is a thing we've decided to commit our time to doing, and hopefully people do not unsubscribe. Well, I just did, but everyone else won't, I'm sure. Everyone else, please stay on. And thank you all for listening. Please remember to rate, review, and subscribe, not unsubscribe. Uh, thanks to Lee Montgomery for our, our theme song, our shiny new theme song. Hell yeah. Remastered 2021 version. Blank check theme, brackets 2021. Thanks to Joe Bowen and Pat Rounds for our artwork. Uh, go to our Shopify page for some nerdy merch, including a restock of the Comedy Points coins and the Talk in the Walk 2020 shirt. Uh, go to blankstyrate.com for some real nerdy shit. Tune in next week. We're going straight into Great Mouse Detective, right? Uh, that's right. Well, screen Clements, baby. So fire up that Disney Plus. We're talking rad again, baby. And as always, I'm David. Yep. No, I was doing the joke about how long it takes you to say I'm David at the beginning, so I did it again at the end, but I, I'm the one who said I'm David, even though I'm Griffin. Yeah, it was really weird, but, you know, I sort of got what you were going for. <laughs>